Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Voodoo is a word to conjure with. And conjure is the right word. Because the high priest of voodooism was called a conjure man. It was he to whom the practitioners of voodoo turned when they wanted spells cast or lifted, enemies punished, or love affairs promoted. As voodoo spread northward from the island of Haiti to the Americas, and particularly to New Orleans, it should be noted that its most powerful conjurers were women. Dambala Udeo, all-powerful one, see your knife, the sacred knife of our ancient gods. See, Dambala, the knife has drawn blood, and you, Dambala, you will now have another soul. Oh, Dambala, look with mercy and kindness upon this servant who will continue to serve you faithfully, now and forever. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The House of the Voodoo Queen, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Jordan Charney and Joan Loring. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. All of us have pictured in our imagination the perfect dream house. The castle in Spain, or the little cottage on the mountaintop overlooking that blue lake in the green valley. But few of us are ever fortunate enough to have our dream come true. Douglas and Helen Fenton were two young people who had that good fortune. And as we first meet them, they're having the happy experience of being shown through their perfect house in New Orleans which they've acquired through the death of an uncle Douglas Fenton never knew existed. And uh, this was used as a music room in the old days. Oh, I can just see it. Can't you, Doug? It's a beautiful room. Nice and sunny. I uh, think I have given you a thorough tour of your new home. And unless you have any questions, I should be getting back to the office. I promise you'll be our first dinner guest. 
Won't he, Doug? Oh, you bet. There are still a lot of questions I have about Uncle Timmy that I'll want answered. I am at your service. Good day and good luck and good health. Uh, don't bother, Mr. Fenton. I know the way out. Oh, Doug, I'm so happy. I just love this house. Wait till you see what I do with it. What was that? The, the movers? Don't be silly, darling. They left hours ago. Remember. Probably something fell. Didn't sound like something falling. <laughs> Chuck, oh, I'm so glad you're home. How did it go today, darling? Any better? I really can't tell you, Doug, because oh, I'm so ashamed. But I didn't stay home. I guess I'm just a big coward. Oh, don't be silly. Anyone would be frightened by what goes on in this place. Oh, oh Doug. Oh, what are we going to do? I told you. We'll sell the house and find another. Did you reach Mr. Lamour's? No, no luck. When I called, he was out. And when he called me back, I was in a meeting and couldn't take the call, but he promised to... Oh, that must be him now. Hello? Mr. Fenton, Lemur's here. Sorry, we missed connections all day. What can I do for you? Mr. Lemur's, I don't know how to tell you this, but, well, Helen and I think the house is haunted. If you don't like the house, you can always put it on the market. We love the house. That is, we thought we loved it. it. It's well, you can't live in a house where all night long you hear screams and chain rattlings and during the day thumpings and well, there's an odor, an indescribable odor of of rot and decay that sweeps through the house from time to time. It's here now, as a matter of fact, and we wanted to know if if you had had any complaints. The from... house has been empty for years. Well, well, maybe that's the reason. H have you heard anything that... Well, about the house being haunted? You're serious? Of course. Then I can only tell you that feeling the way you do, you shouldn't stay in the house. I'll give you the names of some real estate agents who might be willing to handle it. Well, uh, have a seat, Mrs. Fenton. Tell me how I can help you. Well, we have a house we'd like to put on the market. Well, of course. Uh, would you give me the location? It's in an old neighborhood. Uh, 66 Delacorte Street. Uh, yes, yes, I, I know the house. I, I thought it was vacant. Well, we just moved in. My husband's uncle left him the house, and we decided to move to New Orleans and live here. Miss Fenton, I'll be honest with you. The house has a bad reputation. I don't understand. I think you do. Any honest real estate agent would have to warn a prospective buyer that there are definite problems connected with your house. Of course. I understand that. Well, then you also understand I'd have to offer the house way below the market value. How far below? I don't think I could ask more than $20,000. 20000 $20, my husband and I wouldn't be interested at that figure. Thank you for your time. Oh, not at all. If you change your mind, you know where to find me. Now, how can a pretty girl look so unhappy after a dinner like this? Huh? When the girl is thinking of going home to a house that scares her and that no real estate agent wants to handle. Relax. Look, we'll put an ad in all the papers and sell it ourselves. You know, it, it might be better that way. We save a commission. Oh, darling. Mm -hmm. That's why I love you. You take such a big load off my shoulders and make everything seem so easy. Oh, isn't that what husbands are for? Hmm? I can think of a few other uses. And that's one reason why I love you. When are we going to put the ads in? First thing tomorrow. Duck. Duck. Mm. Wake up. Mm. Mm. What? Doug. Mm. Did you leave our faucet on? What? The 
Water. Don't you hear it? Yes. Yes, I hear it. Did you check the bathroom? I was afraid to. Anyway, it certainly doesn't sound as if it's coming from the bathroom. No. No, it seems to be right over the bed. Oh, oh, oh. I can't stand it, Doug. Can't you do something? Why, I, I don't know what to... Tell it to go away, whatever it is. Do you, do you think that would work? We should call the police. Oh, I would. I would if I felt they could help. Whatever it is hasn't hurt us, only annoyed us. So I, I think maybe if we show we're not bothered, the noises and the smells will stop. I don't think I can do that, Doug. Yeah, I know. I know. That's why we put the ads in the papers. Oh, Doug, hold me. Hold me close. What's that? If it's ghosts, they've come to the front door. But who could come at this time of night? You talk as if it were three in the morning. It's only 10.30, and this is a late town. Well, I suppose I'd better see who it is. I'll come with you. Be right with you. Oh, I'm so sorry. I never dreamed I'd be waking you. I'll come back some other time. Oh, no. We weren't asleep. Come on in. Come in. Uh, well, it, it was the advertisement in the Picayune. The house is for sale. Oh, yes, it is. I'm Doug Fenton, and this is my wife, Helen. Uh, I'm Zoe Lemaitre. You're interested in the house? I am. Are you married? No. I'm quite alone. But this is a large house. The ad described how many... Darling, were... I'm sure Miss Lemaitre knows how large the house is. She's interested. I know the house is large, but I'm hooked on antiquities. Um, I think before we actually get down to business, I should tell you. I know all about the reputation this house has in this city. You do? I do. And you still want to buy it? If I can afford it. And I think that the only way you're going to dispose of it is to sell it very cheaply. Uh, Miss Lemaitre, just how cheaply are you thinking? Or aren't you prepared to make an offer? Oh, I'm not only prepared. I brought this certified check along. <laughs> You've made up your mind. <laughs> Here it is. Oh, wow. Massey? Seventy-eight hundred dollars. <laughs> Why, that's, that's just... A fair <laughs> offer. Considering the reputation of the house. Doug Fenton. Miss Lemaitre? Are you too angry with me to join me in a café fit? <laughs> it's my wife who's angry. Oh. I never can stay mad at girls as pretty as you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you find me fascinating, Mr. Fenton? Completely. I trust I have the same effect on you. Oh. It's not you who interests me. It's your house. Why? I can't tell you. Everyone in this town seems to know what's wrong with my house except Helen and me. They know there's something wrong. That's all they know. Oh, and you know more, beautiful Zoe. Hmm? Ah, yes. Behind those beautiful green eyes lies secrets. And your attitude is one reason why I can't tell you. You wouldn't believe me anyway. Try me. All right. The house you're living in doesn't really belong to you. <laughs> I have a deed that says it does. That house was stolen from the daughter of Marie Laveau. Marie Laveau? Who's she? The most powerful bokor in the history of voodoo. The beautiful black woman who ruled as the voodoo queen of New Orleans for half a century. You, Douglas Fenton, are living in the house of the voodoo queen. And she wants you out. When a landlord wants to evict a tenant, the tenant can always take his case to court. But when the fanciful notion is advanced that the landlord is really a voodoo queen who lived back in the 19th century, 
that tenant has a problem. I'll be back shortly with a terrifying solution found by Doug Fenton in Act Two. Voodoo is an African religion which has been variously described and downgraded by such descriptive phrases as black magic, mumbo-jumbo, or a mess of meaningless ritualistic incantations practiced and believed in only by the ignorant and superstitious. Nevertheless, it survives. Douglas Fenton has been told that voodoo presents a very real and serious threat to his living in a house he inherited in New Orleans. But Douglas Fenton is a skeptic. Uh, you're, you're too much, Zoe. Oh? But you must really think I'm the biggest sucker you ever saw if you expect me to sell you a $60,000 house for $7,800 because of some crazy story about a voodoo queen. Wait, wait, wait where, where are you going? Before I called you ignorant, now I know you're a fool. And I don't like fools. Sit down. Go home, Douglas. Go home to your pretty, silly wife. And the two of you can sit and laugh at Marie Laveau. But in the night when your blood runs cold and a nameless terror shakes your bones, remember me. And if you can, remember to call on the cochonnerie and pray they show you mercy. Hey, you think this stuff is for real, don't you? I was born in New Orleans, as were my mother and grandmother. We know the power of the cochonnerie. If I apologize, will you sit down? I will sit, but it's useless. You will still disbelieve. Well, can you blame me? I'm a product of the 20th century. You tell me a pretty wild story and mention things I, I've, I've never even heard of, like this, this Koshan Gri. The Koshan Gri are an ancient society of voodoo priests. And what's your connection with them? They asked me for a favor. It's not wise to oppose them. And the favor was to buy my house, huh? Well, why? Why do they want it? Because it was the home of Marie Leveau. Because it really belongs to her, and they want it as a shrine. And their headquarters. What are you doing at this cafe this afternoon? Hmm? What took you out of your office? Oh, the problem. Huh? I've always found that a walk in some fresh air helps me. Huh. Don't you find it strange that your walk should lead to the back streets? And this particular cafe? I wanted to get away from crowds. And how was it that I happened to be here? Well, you can answer that better than I. Yes, I can. Read this note. I received it at noon. Cafe Lafitte, 3.30. Fenton will be there. Oh. Helen? <laughs> Helen, darling? <laughs> Helen, what's the matter? Oh, Doc. Oh, I'm so glad you're home. So glad. Look. Look there, on the floor. What the devil is it? What does it look like? Like a chicken that has had its ne neck wrung. That's what it is. It, I found it on our doorstep. Along with the chicken, I found this. And this looks like a child's drawing of some kind of snake. No, not a child, Doug. Not a child. Now, according to the police, these are voodoo symbols. Have you ever heard of voodoo? Strange that you should mention that. I had a crash course earlier today. What? The girl who came here to buy our house. I ran into her today at a sidewalk cafe. She seemed to know a lot about it. She told me... Yes? Uh, no, it, it's, it's not important. What did the police say? Well, that these were voodoo symbols. That they may be the work of a prankster, or it might be a believer. And someone who thinks voodoo magic actually works. Someone with a grudge against us. The Koshan Gri. I hoped I'd find oh. you here. Why, Mr. Fenton, what a surprise. Now, look, don't, don't try to put me on. Uh, you probably have a piece of paper on you somewhere that reads Cafe Lafitte, 822. Fenton will be there. <laughs> You're really rather charming, you know, Doug. Well, I try. 
Particularly when someone looks like you. <laughs> you know, I've never met a girl who even came close to you in looks. I think you've bewitched me. Of course. But what have you done to me? Put a love spell on me. I think you're trying to tell me something. And if I am? We should find a more private place. I shouldn't tell you this. Mm. Oh, Doug, darling, I never felt like this before in my life. Mm. Never with anyone. Oh, you're a beautiful liar. But I love to hear it. I mean it, Doug. Oh, you're an astonishing girl. <laughs> really? We've oh. been here for two hours, and you've never once mentioned my wife. Oh. Should I have? Well, let's just say it's uh, unusual. Oh. You're an experienced adulterer. Ouch. <laughs> now, why did I bring her name up? I don't know. I do. It's because I'm worried about the things she finds on our doorstep. What sort of things? Well, a chicken with its neck wrung. <gasps> a piece of cardboard with a crudely drawn snake. Oh, oh yes, that, that means something to you, doesn't it? Spells. They're put in or near people's houses for a purpose. And they mean something? Of course. I'm almost afraid to ask. You should be. The chicken with its neck wrung means death. Helen? Helen, are you all right? Yes, Doug, darling, I'm fine. Oh. Well, how, how was today, huh? I mean, uh... Well, if you mean, were there any other little presents left on our doorstep? No. Well, well, that's, that's good news. Maybe they've stopped. I won't complain. After all, you're home early tonight. What does that mean? Oh, nothing, really. It's just that well, you've been working so late at the office so often, and I realize that I'm not as attractive as I used to be, and although I guess I'm not much... Yeah, I hate to hear you talk like and that. I hate to talk like that. Maybe I wouldn't if... If what? I know how attractive you are. And there are a lot of beautiful women in the world. And oh, please, and please. This isn't necessary, Helen. I'm afraid it, it's very necessary. Will you... Will you stop seeing Zoe Lemaitre? I'm as mad as anyone can get and still not commit murder. It's your associates. Those voodoo priests you tell me are called uh, the Koshong Greed. They're not my associates. Sometimes they ask me to do favors for them, and I know it's not wise to refuse. Oh, they must really be grateful to you. They've rewarded you by telling Helen every time we met. Oh. Now tell them to lay off. I won't. You won't? What do you want to do, break us up? You know better than that, Doug. It's just that I don't want to make a fool of myself. If I go to the Cochon Gris with this request, they will simply tell me what I've been telling you all along if you want it to stop. Sell the house. We would, gladly, if we could get anywhere near what it's worth. What is it worth, really, Doug? You can't find a buyer who'll even make an offer except the Cochon Gris. And they think they're being very generous. I won't be taken. You inherited the house. Whatever you get is pure profit. Oh, you really don't understand, do you? I know that if you won't sell, then Helen will have to suffer. Not if I stop seeing you. That would be your choice. And I'm making it. Right now. If you can let me walk away rather than ask a simple favor of people who owe you, then I'll walk. Goodbye, my love. Have I told you it's nice having you home for dinners again? You have? Oh, you're bored with me. No, 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 no. With myself. And you're going to have me home a lot more from now on. That's very good news. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I've lost my job. You're kidding. Mm, I wish I were. So they called me in yesterday with all sorts of excuses about cutbacks and economies and... 
Well, I'm out. I was the last man in, and now I'm the first man out. Let's sell the house and get out of New Orleans. Oh, Doug, don't you see? It will be wonderful. We'll be starting all over again. I'm back. So I see. May I come in? (laughs) What happened to your key? I threw it away so I wouldn't be tempted to use it. But I couldn't stay away. I'm glad. Did you miss me? Oh, Doug. Oh, Zoe. Zoe, Zoe, my love, my darling. You don't know how much I missed hearing those words the last two weeks. Yeah, well, I'm afraid you're going to miss them a lot more. Why? I've lost my job, and Helen's at me to sell the house and get away from the city. And, incidentally, you. Oh, She no longer cares how little we get for it. She's completely fed up. And you, Doug? Well, it's very tough to put up a decent argument for staying. If you could, would you stay? How can I stay without money? If it's money that separates us, you don't have to say goodbye at all. (laughs) Excuse me, love. I didn't know I was talking to a wealthy plantation owner. I only meant I might be able to get you all the money you want. The only friends I know you have are the... Tightwad Koshong Gree, who only want to pay a $7,800 for a $60,000 house. They've been known to put a higher price on other things. Like what? Souls. Oh. <laughs> you know, you know, you're really too much with that voodoo business. If there were anything to it, which you know I don't believe for a minute, I'd have to be crazy to be willing to sell my soul. I didn't mention your soul, did I? I can't sell what I don't own, and as far as I know, I only have one soul. There are others you can pledge. Other souls you can speak for. Would you care to put a name to that soul? Anyone near and dear to you. Like Helen? She would be one. I don't know whether to laugh or just walk out of here. I'd never hurt you, Tommy. Just, Just what kind of a man do you think I am? A man I can love. Love? That word sounds very strange on your lips. The same lips that can talk about me selling my wife's soul. Oh, go away. You're just like everyone else, crying about not having any money and not willing to pay the price for getting all you want, everything you want, including me. Helen, Helen, what are you doing? Packing. You can't seem to make up your mind, so I'm making it up for you. I told Mr. Vincent, the real estate agent, to take whatever he can for the house, and we're getting out. Tonight. Oh, I've been expecting you. There's a café filtre on the coffee table. How did you know I'd come back? Because I chose you. I couldn't make a mistake about the man I chose to love. Well, when you stop patting yourself on the back, I'd better tell you that the only reason I'm back is because I don't believe any of this voodoo stuff. And that's why I'm willing to go along. Of course. And to prove it, I'm not going to make any deal where I have to shoot, stab, poison, or in any way do anything that's going to cause physical harm to Helen. No one's going to ask that of you. All that's required is this knife. And your blood. If you're in love with a beautiful girl who practices voodoo and believes that a drop of your blood drawn from you by a sacred knife will bring you luck, why not? And from there, it's just a short step to making deals about souls, yours, and even others. Because after all, it doesn't really work. Or does it? I'll be back in a moment with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. I think all of us feel some small twinges of apprehension... When we sit in a doctor's office waiting for the injection we know we must have, but 
How do you describe the feelings of a young man sitting opposite a girl he adores who's wielding a ceremonial knife preparatory to drawing some blood? Zoe, my love, you're beautiful and an enchantress. But somehow you look different with that knife in your hand. May I see it? Be careful. It's very sharp. <sighs> and heavy. It's pure gold. I don't suppose you could use something smaller than this. It really looks lethal. I could use a lot of different things, but then this paper would be meaningless. Well, it's blank. At the moment. It won't be after you write your wife's name on it. Well, before I do that, what am I supposed to get? As much money as you need. Or want. Oh, well, suppose I said I want a million dollars. The amount isn't important. Just trust me, and for one year, money will rain on your head in a golden shower. And what happens after the year's up? We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. What have I got to lose? Nothing. But before you write your wife's name, you know, of course, what she is losing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm pledging her immortal soul. <laughs> How is she, Doctor? I'm afraid I don't have very good news for you, Mr. Fenton. Haven't you found out yet what's wrong? The tests are inconclusive, and none of the medication we've been giving her seems to be able to help. Well, what is it? Is it a bug or a virus? Or... We just don't know. She's been asking for you. Helen? Helen? I'm here. Oh, Doc. You didn't have any trouble getting away from the office? I keep telling you, darling, I'm, I'm my own boss now. And if things keep going the way they are, I, I may even turn out to be a tycoon. I'm dying, Doc. No, Helen, please, now, you, you mustn't even... It's even... all right. You, you mustn't feel badly. The way things went since we came to New Orleans, I'm beginning to think that death might be the best thing for me. Helen, I don't want you to talk that way. Doc... I want you to promise me one thing. Just one thing, please. Anything. When I die... No, please, now, will you stop talking about dying? Please, Doug, listen to me. You must get out of that house. Get rid of it. Promise me, Doug. You'll never set foot again in that horrible house. <laughs> Oh, delicious. Mm. I do adore champagne. Well, when are we going to make it all legal? You mean with a wedding and everything like that? Oh, and what a wedding. What a reception. And what a honeymoon. The biggest, most expensive... Helen's been dead only three months. Not a very long period of mourning. Who says? A lot of people. Nasty, gossipy people. Dull, stodgy people. Who cares about them? Or what they say to your business associates. What can they say? That you became very rich very suddenly, that your wife died mysteriously, that I'm a witch, and that perhaps people should be careful about doing business with you. Oh, yes, yes. I, I'd almost forgotten. It's all because of that voodoo group you fool around with, hmm? You'll have to admit that everything happened after we went through the ceremony they told me to perform. Right. I'll admit that first sugar deal on the commodities market was luck. But after that, give me a little credit. I got smart about commodities. And now I know what I'm doing. So, when do we get married, hmm? Why is marriage so important to you? You wouldn't be stalling me, would you, my love? Don't be silly, Doc. Shouldn't you... Shouldn't you wait and see when your one-year contract is up that your luck doesn't change? <laughs> Come in. Come in, Lamour. Sit down. Your offices are most impressive, Fenton. Most impressive. Uh, you said that you wanted to see me on a matter of utmost urgency. That's right. First, I owe you an apology. For what? For my cowardice. I don't know what you're talking about. The facts about your uncle's house, which I knew and withheld from you deliberately. Mm, no, no, no. Forget it. Forget it. I'm, I'm out of the house and you have nothing to reproach yourself for. I had heard you sold the house, and I also know the price. 
That suggested to me that you still had your reasons for... Look, I just didn't want the trouble of looking around for buyers. I grabbed the first offer I got. From Miss Lemaitre. Something wrong with that? I will be brief. I didn't tell you and your wife the history of the house because I was afraid... Afraid of the cochon gris. Afraid of the power of voodoo. Fenton, you're in danger. Me? Yes. How did your wife die? Some unknown virus. Some kind of fluke, the doctor said. Don't you think that's strange? An unknown disease in this day and age? Uh, look, Lamours, you can believe what you want, but leave me out. I can't. Because of your relationship with Miss Lemaitre, I beg of you one favor. Tonight, come with me and meet Louis Gaston. It may be your only chance to save yourself. I don't feel any need for salvation. Now, if you... You've talk... heard of Louis? Never. Louis Castan is a 90-year-old Cajun who's lived all his life in the bayous. He knows more about voodoo than any other human being. <laughs> what are you doing? Helping you out of my office since you won't leave when I ask you to. I'll gladly go. If you'll tell me you haven't let her talk you into making some kind of silly bargain... <laughs> Why did you say that? So you have. You've sold your soul. Fenton, for the love of God, come with me to the bio tonight. Louis, this is Douglas Fenton. I hope we meet in time, no? I'm here only because Mr. Lemours practically kidnapped me. Mr. Lemours has lived in Louisiana a long time. He knows much about voodoo and Cajuns. All right, all right. What do you have to tell me? First, you tell me what you have done with the Bocor. What the devil is a Bocor? A very bad person. One who knows the darkest secrets of voodoo and uses them for evil ends. One who is pledged to Tambala Odeo, the great snake god. Oh, this all sounds like something out of the Middle Ages. No, Mr. Fenton. It is much older than that. Have you ever seen a knife like this? Uh, oh, maybe. I don't know. I, I've, I've seen a lot of knives. But one like this you would remember, no? A pure gold knife... With these writings. Well, what if I have? If you have only seen it, Mr. Fenton, that is well. But if it has drawn your blood, that is very bad. How come you know so much about all this voodoo ritual? I had a wife. I loved her much, yes. She loved other things more. She sold my soul, Mr. Fenton, sold my soul to Dambala Odeo. I found her just in time, and I defeated her and her boko. But I paid a price. I cannot use my limbs. You see, Mr. Fenton, I must sit here until the end. But Dambala Odeo and I, we will fight, you understand? And that's why you brought me here, Lamour, huh? Because you think I've fallen somehow under the spell of... The Boko Zoe Le Maître. We are going to be married. When? We haven't set the date, but she has agreed to marry me. She will not marry you. If, as I believe, she is Boko, she will want to destroy you and take your soul. She will never marry. I know you're wrong. But, well, uh, look, as long as I came here, what must I do if you're right? She must follow the ritual for the sacrifice. She will ask you to perform some ancient marriage rite to strengthen the vows. It will be a powerful voodoo, and she will need a drug. And she will ask you to drink. If you drink, nothing can save you. If she does ask me to go through this ceremony, is there anything I can do? You can use this knife. I give it to you. 
the gold knife. It is easily concealed in your clothing, as you see. And you will use it. But I thought you said that this knife could only be used by a bokor. Oh, on a bokor. Where were you last night, my love? You're not the only one who's jealous, you know. You never have to worry about me. You should know by now that I'm yours, my love, for life. <laughs> Zoe, <laughs> are we going to get married? Of course. When? Whenever you like. You mean that? You really mean that? You set the date. Today? Oh, really, Duck? You've got to give a girl a chance to get ready. All right, all right, all right. Well, how about Saturday? Saturday. Saturday sounds lovely. There's just one silly favor I'd like to ask. Oh, anything. What? Before the real wedding, with the minister and everything. I know it's superstitious, but you know you're Zoe. I just wouldn't feel that we were truly married unless we went through a little native ceremony that my family has observed in every marriage. A native ceremony? It's nothing, really. Just the two of us before an ancient altar. I know you'll think it's nonsense, but it means so much to me. So much that I don't think I can marry you unless you go through with it. This is my old house. Why do we have to come here? Shh, shh, don't ask so many questions. Just pretend we're playing some childish game. It will seem that way to you, Doug, but to me it's... Well, the way we've always done things. What's that? The altar. But that statue, it's... He, he looks frightening, but it's just an old statue of the snake god that blesses every marriage. Zoe, Zoe, please. You know I don't believe all this. Oh. Maybe you're used to the darkness and the candles and the drums, but... Here, drink this and you'll feel better. What's that? A little ceremonial wine, darling. It was left on the altar for us. Drink it. Do you really want me to drink from that goblet? Yes. You insist? Darling, it's the only way. You will drink from me. If you come into my arms and hold the goblet to my lips. Uh, now who's acting childishly? It's the only way. All right. Here, dearest. Drink. <gasps> Doug, you're holding me too tight. Doug, the knife. No, no. Dumbbell, help me. <laughs> I drank, my love. And now, now we'll be together always. Just, just the way you wanted it. <laughs> A friend of mine told me the story of an investigative reporter who penetrated some real voodoo ceremonies and photographed the strictly forbidden rites. The pictures somehow were ruined in development, and the journalist developed an unfortunate tick. His right hand, the hand that operates a camera, now moves ceaselessly in the air, completely out of control. The doctors diagnose it as a nervous disorder. But of course, they don't practice voodoo. I'll be back in a moment. It's amazing how many of us invest inanimate objects with supernatural powers. On the other hand... Perhaps our superstitions are only faint memory traces, throwbacks to our ancestors who prayed to rocks and trees and mountains. Today, we've progressed beyond those beliefs. We're sure that inanimate objects are powerless. On the other hand, we're told that nothing is sure except death and taxes. And, of course, the fact I'll be here tomorrow. Our cast included Joan Loring, 
Jordan Charney, Rene Roy, Dan Ockel, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. After last night and today, I'm taking no chances. Maybe with your superior intelligence, you have no worries about our abortive attempt at Satanism. But I have. Look, I was the victim, and since a crack on the head denied me any knowledge of what happened, I'm only hoping you can give me the straight goods. Uh, the straight goods. A peculiarly inept term for what we are engaged in, my brother in Satan. Damn it, it's not a deal in semantics, Anton. Now, what happened after I summoned up the fiend? I mean, how did you escape, and how could I have been harmed? As long as I was safe in the magic triangle within the circle. I warned you to keep your feet still. If you touch any part of the circle itself or the triangle within it, you are at the mercy of all the devils in hell. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you William Powell and Myrna Loy in After the Thin Man. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When Edgar Allan Poe popularized the detective story, he found the great common denominator of American entertainment. Millions of us have stayed up past bedtime to explore the fascinating realm of whodunit, including the President of the United States. And you can find devotees in every walk of life. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, and probably policeman too. Perhaps we haven't investigated this branch of the drama quite as often as we should in the Lux Radio Theater. But when we do engage a manhunter, we get the very best. Tonight, our play is After the Thin Man, adapted from the MGM picture, and naturally starring the same two players that go with a thin man story, Myrna Loy and William Powell. It's an occasion for great rejoicing, but we also must hang our heads a little, because it's exactly four years since Miss Loy was last at this microphone. There's more to the story of After the Thin Man than just the exciting quest of a criminal. Because our detective is the extraordinary Nick Charles. And Nick has a lovely wife named Nora. They happen to be very much in love. But even love can't keep Nora from interfering with her husband's business when she has an idea. And Nora is a girl with many ideas. Together they can solve just about any problem you give them. But you don't really need a detective to discover that Lux Flakes is the simple answer to your household problems. It's a deduction that millions of women have made after giving Lux Flakes a trial. Now, if your wits have been thoroughly sharpened and you're ready for anything to happen, we'll raise the curtain on the first act of After the Thin Man, starring William Powell as Nick Charles and Myrna Loy as Nora. <laughs> the railroad station in San Francisco... Into the dim maze of tracks, 
rose a mighty streamliner, sleek and shiny, after its mad dash across the country. With the final throb of its powerful engines, it comes to rest. From the gate tumbles a crowd of reporters and photographers. They rush breathlessly up and down the length of the platform, eager to be the first to greet the arriving celebrities, Mr. and Mrs. Nick Charles. Where's Nick? He's probably in. He's probably in that car over there. Come on, let's get a statement from him. Hey, is Nick Charles in this car? Mr. Charles, two cars back. Uh, thanks. Oh, there he is. Hey, Nick. Hello, Nick. Nicky. How does it feel well, to be home? Well, you going to stay with us a while now? I'm from the Chronicle, Mr. Charles. Hey, Can I have a statement? Easy, guys. Easy, one at a time. Darling, these are the gentlemen of the press. Gentlemen, my wife. Hello. 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 How do you do? Uh, how's about a statement, Nick? Are you going to keep on with your detective work? No, gentlemen. I've retired. Now on, I'm just going to take care of my wife's money. So I'll have something in my old age. Oh, you said you'd retired before, but I noticed you took that thin man case in New York. Oh, that thin man was a beaut. They're still talking about it. You'd take a case like that now, wouldn't you? Not a chance. I just took that to please my wife. She wanted some excitement. Well, I guess you had it, Mr. Charles. Oh, it was wonderful. Two men tried to kill him. But he's not going to take any more cases. You can print that. That's the girl. So long, gentlemen. Come on, darling. Oh, goodbye. Right, nice to meet you, Charles. Charles. Good night. Goodbye. Nice to have met you. Nick, slow down. I can't keep up with you going. Oh. Uh, excuse me, lady. I guess I wasn't looking where I was going. No. I guess you weren't. Hiya, Fingers. Well, well, Nick Charles. Well, how are you? Fine. How's business, Fingers? Business? Oh, I quit that racket. Nick, my purse. It's gone. Oh, that's a shame. All right, I want you to meet Fingers McCoy. Uh, this is my wife, Fingers. Your, your wife? Mm-hmm. Say, I didn't know she w- Oh, I'm sorry about your purse, Mrs. Charles. What'll I do, Nick? I know I had it with me. Oh, it'll turn up. Won't it, Fingers? I certainly hope so. Oh, sure. Well, so long, Nick. Glad I bumped into you. Goodbye, Mrs. Charles. Right. Goodbye. Nick, I've got to go back to the train. No, I wouldn't bother, darling. Let's get home. I just can't go off. Come on now, come on. You don't want to embarrass him, do you? What do you mean? Fingers. He's a purse snatcher. Think of his feelings. A purse snatcher? Well, he must have taken it. Certainly. But you see, he didn't know you were my wife. You'll get it back in the morning mail, darling. He's a very honest pickpocket. Oh, Nick, you do know the nicest people. Hiya, Nick. Welcome home. Hiya, Bumps. How's the boy? Never better, Nick. In the pink. See you around. A prize fighter, darling? No, no. A wrestler. Oh, a wrestler. Well, that's different. Hiya, Nicky. What's a good boy? Well, hello, Slats. How's everything? I'm doing okay. Glad to see you, pal. Likewise. Now, there's a sweet character. He ought to be in jail just to play safe. He got out last Tuesday. Oh. Welcome home, Nora. Oh, hello. Thank you. Nice to see you, my dear. Thank you very much. Now, who are those people, darling? You wouldn't know them. They're respectable. Oh. You know, darling, the best thing about going away is coming back home. I suppose you remember that tonight is New Year's. I know. Got your keys, darling? Yeah. I also suppose you've got some ideas on the subject. Very definite ideas. I was afraid of that. I want to lock the doors and plug the bells, cut off the telephone, and crawl into bed for months. Mrs. Charles, you're a woman after my own heart. I won't be awake at midnight, so I'll kiss you now. Happy New Year, Nora. Happy New Year, darling. Hiya, folks. What you standing out there for? Come on in. Hey, what is this? Well, it's our house, all right. Come on, come on. Make yourself at home, folks. Well, let's go in, darling. He says it's all right. Oh, well, as long as we're invited. There's a bar right in there. Help yourself. Thank you very much. Okay. What's the celebration? Shh, we're giving a surprise party to Nick and Nora. Nick and Nora? Sure. Don't you know Nick and Nora? No, we don't. Neither do I. But that's not going to spoil my fun. It's New Year's, so what's the odds? Go on in. Fake it. It's a cinch. Oh, thanks for the tip. Sure. Get in there and get some of that Napoleon brandy before it's all gone. Do. <clears throat> May I have this dance, Mrs. Charles? Thank you, sir. You're a gent. Who are all these people? Well, now, let's see. That looks like Moe Stone over there. He's a bookie. A fellow with him is a police captain. And I believe the gentleman in the loud suit runs a pool room. That fellow in a fireman's hat... Never mind. A... I get the general idea. Mrs. Charles, welcome home, madam. Thank you. How are you, Peters? Never better, Mr. Charles. I'm sorry about the party, sir, but they forced their way in. Yeah, knowing my friends, I can believe that. Nick, I smell something burning. Probably just the living room rug or... Uh... If I may be allowed to suggest, sir, that's probably Mrs. Charles' aunt. She's been calling all day and very much annoyed. She wants you to come to dinner this evening, Mrs. Charles. Oh, dear. Goodbye, darling. See you next year. <clears throat> she expects you, too, Mr. Charles. Me? Aunt Catherine wants me to come to dinner? Well, there must be some mistake. She couldn't want you, Nick. 
I'll take it in the bedroom, Peters. Nick, come with me. If it's your Aunt Catherine, get out of it. No more family dinners. I wouldn't go through that again if you had twice as much money. Hello? Hello, Nora. Who is this? This is Selma. Oh, hello, darling. Darling? Aunt Catherine? Shut up. It's my cousin Selma. How are you, Selma? Nora, I had to call you. I wanted to make sure you were coming tonight. Well, I'm afraid not, Selma. You see... Nora, you've got to come. I'm in terrible trouble. What? Please, I can't tell you now, but you must come. I'm desperate. I... Oh, wait a minute. Selma, put down that phone. I won't. I'm speaking to Nora. Hello? I told you not to call anyone. Hello, Selma. Give me the phone. Hello, dear. Hello, is this... How are you, Nora? This is Aunt Catherine. Well, what's the matter with Selma? Oh, nothing at all, dear. You know Selma well enough not to pay too much attention to her. We'll see you tonight, Nora. Well, you see, it's New Year's Eve, Aunt Catherine. The old battle axe. Shut up. What? Excuse me, Aunt Catherine. I was talking to the dog. Oh. We'll expect you at 7.30. All right, Aunt Catherine. We'll come. Goodbye. What did you say? I said we'd be over for dinner. Oh, my own wife. I'm sorry, Nikki, but I had to do it. It's Selma. She's in trouble. You like Selma, don't you? Not as much as that. But she sounded so funny, as if she'd been crying. Mm, living with your Aunt Catherine, I can't say I blame her. <laughs> Selma. <laughs> Selma, stop that crying. Do you want the servants to hear her? I don't care, Aunt Catherine. I'm going crazy. <laughs> I can't stand it any longer. I'm going to call the police. You'll do nothing of the sort. Haven't we paid out enough to hush up his other scandals? He never did anything like this before. How do we know but what he may be dead? I told you I'd handle this. I can't go on this way. Rob is my husband. Be he... quiet. Yes, Henry? Uh, beg pardon, madam, but shall I set a place for Mr. Robert tonight? Certainly. Mr. Robert will be here. Very good, madam. You know he won't be here, Aunt Catherine. I know nothing of the sort. Now go upstairs and make yourself presentable. When Nora comes, I'm going to tell her. You will not tell her. I will not have that husband of hers snooping into our family affairs. I don't care. He can help us. I'm going to tell him the whole story. <laughs> Catherine wants to speak to you. What did I do now? Use the wrong fork? Nick, listen. Do you know why Robert wasn't here tonight? Sure, because he's smart. I'm not fooling. He's disappeared. That's swell. Now, if we could only get rid of Aunt Catherine, we'd be all set. Come on. She's in the library with some. Here he is, Aunt Catherine. Oh, Nicholas, I'm sorry to take you away from the family. Oh, that's fine. I mean, it's uh, quite all right. Well, what's, what's all this about, Selma? How long has Robert been gone? Three days. Three days without a word. Oh, you notified the police? Certainly not. And we're not going to. Oh, no. Robert may be kidnapped. He may be lying dead somewhere, but we mustn't do anything about it. Our precious name might get in the paper. Oh, don't pay any attention to her. She's exaggerating the whole affair. However, to please her, I thought you might investigate the matter quietly. With your experience as a... Uh, uh, as a flat foot? And I didn't mean to be as blunt as that. Why not? It's all in the family. Selma, have you any idea where Robert might be? No, but there's a woman mixed up in it. I know it. Selma, you know nothing of the sort. What about the vanity case they sent me from that Chinese restaurant? It was a stupid mistake on their part. Mistake? Some woman left it. He was there with some woman. Selma, you know that Robert worships you. How can you say that? You know he hates me. He only married me for my money. He never did love me. Sometimes I wish he were dead. Well, I, I'm a little confused. Tell me, Selma, do you want him back or don't you? <laughs> Of course, she wants him back. Don't, Selma, please. Come, Selma. I'll take you up to your room. Dr. Keller will be here at a moment. He'll give you something for your nerves. Excuse me. Nora, Nicholas. Well, Nick, what do you think about it? I'm not thinking at all. What are you getting me into? There are lots of detectives in this town, men who need the job. But no one as good as you, Nicky. Yeah, that won't get you a thing. I've retired. But this is different. This is for Selma. You will help find Robert, won't you? Why? I didn't lose him. It's your chance, Nick. It'll get you in right with the family. That's just what I'm afraid of. Nicky. Get your hat, darling. We're going to get out of here while we still got the chance. Well, where's it going to be? It's still New Year's Eve. We ought to go someplace. All right, let's go look for Robert. Now, listen, my sweet. Hello, Nick. Hello, Nora. Oh, hiya, David. David, how nice to see you. What are you standing out here for? Oh, they don't let me in the house anymore. Someone said she'd try and meet me later. I'm afraid she won't be able to make it. Did you know that Robert had disappeared? If he has, it's the only decent thing he's ever done. What's he been up to lately, David? The last thing he pulled on me was a couple of days ago. Called up and said that if I'd give him $25,000, he'd go away and leave Selma to me. Lovely boy. 
What did you say? I asked him to give me a couple of days to think it over. You know, 25000 would be cheap if he'd really go. Why don't you pick up a collection? There are a lot of people who'd like to contribute. Tell me. Did you see Selma? How is she? I'm terribly worried about her. I know. I am, too. Come on, David. We're going to go someplace and get the taste of respectability out of our mouths. Thanks, but I couldn't. Oh, David, why not? I've got too much on my mind. Well, I'm glad you're back anyway. Happy New Year to you. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Selma was a fool not to have married him instead of Robert. They can't all be as lucky as you, darling. Well, where are we going? How do you feel about some Chinese food? Awful. Oh, I'm so sorry. Because we're going to that Chinese restaurant that sent the compact to Selma, the Lai Chi. Please, darling. Now, see here. I- I'm not looking for Robert. Of course you're not. I am. Tell him we're all filled up. I did. He says to tell you his name is Nick Charles. Nick Charles? Where is he? Over by the door. <laughs> ah, now, nah, this is more like it. You must feel right at home in a place like this. Too bad we didn't bring Aunt Catherine. Hello, Nick. How are you? Hello, dancer. Tell me, haven't any tables? Oh, I guess I can find one. Seeing as it's you... You just slumming? That's all, answer. Why? Just wanted to make sure. I don't like business calls on New Year's. Oh, say, I want you to be my partner. Hey, Lumkey, come here. Yes? I want you to meet a friend of mine, Lumkey. This is Nick Charles. And Mrs. Charles. Oh, I'm your friend. You bet you. You sent his brother up, Nick. Lum Ying, remember? Oh, yes, yes. He's the one who spread a tongue war out to include sticking up a bank. Oh, you, you bet you. You catch my baller. You play trick on him. No play trick on him, no catch him, you bet you. He's still in jail? Oh, you bet you. Four, five years more. Goodbye. Oh, nice time, please. Is he a tongue man, too, Mr. Dancer? No, but you never can tell how close brothers are. I thought you might like to know, Nick. Thanks. He's a good guy to have liking him. Oh, there's a table over there with a wall. This way, Mrs. Charles. Nicky, there's Robert. I know, I saw him before. Why didn't you tell me? Robert? Robert? Oh, hello. Good evening, Robert. Happy New Year. Is it? Robert, what are you doing in a place like this? We just saw Selma, Robert. Yeah? She's terribly worried about you. Don't you think you'd better go home? Sure, I'll go home. When I feel like it and not before. Robert! Oh, no, let him go. That's your table, Nick. Oh, is that fellow a friend of yours? On the contrary, he's a relation. He's been hanging around here drunk for three days. He's got a case on our prima donna. I wish you'd toss him out. His wife is going crazy. Oh, that's too bad. I'll speak to his girlfriend. Well, I've done my duty. Hey, Polly. Polly, come here. What's up, Dancer? Now, listen. That boyfriend of yours is pretty drunk. So what? I thought that was the idea. Keep him happy. Sure, but a couple of his relations just blew in. Relations? What do we do? Well, give the customers one more song and then knock off for the night and take him out of here. Okay, but I'm getting sick of that guy. Oh, it'll just be Lamar honey, and then he can turn him loose. Tomorrow's a holiday. The banks will be closed. Ah, that's right. Well, then the next day. Ah, what's the difference? Ain't it worth it? I guess so. That's the girl. I'll make it snappy, Polly. I'll keep an eye on him. Hey, Polly. Yeah, what? I got a message for you. What is it? Your brother's looking for you. My brother? Where is he? In your dressing room. He wants to see you right away. Hello, Polly. What's the matter? You don't look so happy to see me. Please, Phil, don't try to start anything. I'm in a hurry. You've been in a hurry ever since I got back. Can I help it if I got to work? That's not what I'm kicking about. What's going on with this drunk Robert Landis? Nothing. Oh, no? Then what's this check doing on your dressing table? Give me that. A check made out to you, signed by Robert Landis. Get out of here. What are you... Shut up or I'll smack you right in the teeth. I'm in on this, you know. Phil, please. If you don't cut me in, the party's off. I can't cut you in. The check's yours, ain't it? Yes, but... But what? But what? Let me go. Let me go. Sure. But this is just to remind you that I'm in on the deal. You big lug. Look what you've done to my face. How am I going to explain that? There's a lot of things you'll have to explain before I'm through. You and Dancer are taking this Landis guy for plenty of dough, aren't you? What about it? How much? Come on, how much? 25000 Did you get it yet? No. Go ahead, spill it. Some friend of his wife's is putting it up to get him to leave her alone. So you're going to keep him drunk and then collect it for him? When? I don't know. When, I said? Tomorrow night. Okay. I'll be around the next morning. Early. What are you doing here? Hi, 
that answer. Just leave him. So long, Polly. What did that heel want? Nothing. It's okay, Dancer. Now listen. There's a switch in the plans. I just heard that that dough was being handed over tonight. Tonight? That David guy is meeting Landis in front of his house. Now, you better be with Landis, see? I'll be there. I told Nick that you were taking Landis home. Now, make sure they see you as you go out. Sure. And when the dough's delivered, you know what to do. I'll be across the street just in case something goes wrong. Now, get going. And no slip-ups. <laughs> a gum heel, always a gum heel. I don't like gum heels, and I thought you'd quit it when you married a pot of money. Did he call me a pot? I don't like to be critical, Dancer. You know, it doesn't look quite right when you and your partner and your prima donna and your best customer all go out at the same time, and it gives the place a sort of a vacant look. Have you ever been thrown out of a place, Mr. Charles? How many places was it up to yesterday, Mrs. Charles? How many places have you been in, Mr. Charles? Hello? Aunt Catherine, this is Nick. Uh, Nicholas. What? When? I see. Yes, I will. Bye. But if you're throwing here, you can beat it. What's the matter, Nick? Bad news? Dancer, you'd better... Ah, Polly, come in. Another of our travelers has returned. Now, if only Lum Key will... <laughs> No sooner said than done. Oh, someone called me. Quite a gathering of the clan, isn't it? I wonder which one of you would be most surprised if Robert Landis walked in now. You know there's no chance of that, don't you? All of you. Now, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, get out of here. What is it, Nick? What's happened? Robert's been killed. Killed? He was killed on the front steps of your aunt's house. Police are questioning Selma. What's that got to do with us? Go on, get out. You said that before, Dancer, and it's foolish. I'm not going to get out. On the contrary... We're going to have a lot more people in. Listen, you... Hello. Nick Charles speaking. I want to get hold of Lieutenant Abrams, the homicide squad. Why are you calling him? It's a cinch none of us shot, Landis. That's so. Well, then maybe you'd like to explain how you knew he was shot. Curtain calls on Act One of After the Thin Man with Myrna Loy and William Powell. During this short intermission before Mr. DeMille presents Act Two, we introduce a very charming guest. Strike up the band, Lou. That music, ladies and gentlemen, welcomes a real Southern belle, Miss Mary Nell Porter from Memphis, Tennessee. In private life, she's a debutante, but this spring she's touring the country in a very important role as made of cotton, representing our huge cotton industry. We're certainly delighted to welcome you to the Lux Radio Theater, Miss Porter. Thank you very much, Mr. Roy. I'm so glad to be here. I hear that you've been doing quite a little flying the last three months. I certainly have. Over 12,000 miles. And on top of that, I understand that you've had a staggering schedule of fashion shows and radio speeches and personal appearances in 30 different cities. It has been a very interesting experience, and I've enjoyed meeting so many nice people all over the country. We've had such large crowds at all our cotton fashion shows. Well, I'm sure the women want to hear about that. Now, I'd love to talk about it. You know, cotton is terribly smart this year for play suits and street dresses and evening frocks. Now, here, uh, just a minute, please. How about giving us some details? Well, there's a very good-looking red and white striped daytime dress with big sleeves. And has a very full skirt with the cutest Dutch boy pockets. I wear it with blue shoes. That sounds very patriotic. It surely is. Red, white, and blue is always fashionable this year. A lot of the dresses on our show are patriotic. I see where the stripes fit in then. Well, they're smart too. And so are flower prints. My bathing suit has tropical flowers scattered all over it. Oh, so cotton goes swimming. I should say it does. And dancing too. You should see one evening dress in our fashion show. It's a brilliant red muslin with large white Hawaiian flowers all over it. Straight from the South Seas. Well, straight from a storybook. (laughs) 
It has the sweetest puff sleeves and a long basque bodice. Well, tell me, is cotton all glamour? Goodness, no. It's simply wonderful for wearing in town, too. Things like gingham or bouquet or seersucker make beautifully tailored suits. They're cool as can be and awfully easy to take care of. Miss Porter, don't you find it hard to keep all these lovely cottons fresh on your trip? Not at all. You see, the whole wardrobe is luxable. Even some of my shoes and bags. That makes things easy, doesn't it? I should say so. <laughs> Why, new quick lux flakes are simply wonderful. They take such beautiful care of all the lovely new cottons. You know, everything safe in water is safe in lux. Ladies, please note, this year's smart cottons are really fine fabrics, and they must, they must be treated gently, just like washable silks, rayons, and woolens. New Quick Lux is so mild, it keeps them new-looking longer. That's why we use it for everything in our cotton show. Well, we've certainly enjoyed having you with us tonight, Miss Porter. Thank you so much. I'm mighty glad to meet you all. Well, good night, and good luck on your trip home. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Now, our producer, Mr. DeVille. Act two of After the Thin Man, starring William Powell as Nick Charles and Myrna Loy as Nora. It's two hours later. With mystery shrouding the death of Robert Landis, the police have been questioning Selma, who discovered the body. Now the grilling is over, and her nerves are worn to the breaking point. They're going to arrest me. They're going to arrest me, Nora. No, no, of course they're not. They all believe I did it. Aunt Catherine, everyone. They don't, Selma. They don't think that at all. I know. I heard them. Now, darling. But I didn't kill him, Nora. I didn't. I'm sure I didn't. I couldn't have. What? What do you mean? <sighs> Nora, you'll help me, won't you? Tell me what happened. Everything. He came to the house at midnight to get his things. He said he was leaving me. I tried to stop him. He pushed me away and went down the stairs. I followed him to the front door. While he was letting himself out, I went to the library table. There was a gun there. A gun, Selma? I didn't mean to use it. I only wanted to frighten him, to make him come back and listen to me. All right. Go on. I went to the door. He was standing on the steps, looking up and down the street. And then... And then there was a shot. And he fell. Where did the shot come from? I don't know. I don't know. All right, darling. Never mind. You've been through oh. enough. You'd better lie down now and rest. I can't. I can't rest. I've got to think. I've... Nora... Yes? David. What about David? He thinks I'm guilty, too. He thinks I killed Robert. Selma, how could... He must think so, or he wouldn't have taken... He wouldn't have taken what? Nothing. But he mustn't think that. I couldn't bear it. You must tell him. Tell him I didn't do it. Couldn't you tell him? No, no, somebody might be listening. You go to him. Tell him. Hurry! Who is it? It's me, Nora. Hello, Nora. This is a surprise. Come in. I got over as soon as I could, David. Selma What's said that... Is there anything wrong? Oh, you mean you don't know? No, what? What's happened? Well, Robert's been killed. Killed? That's impossible. What do you mean? I saw him only a little while ago. How long ago? About ten o'clock. I met him in front of the house and gave him $25,000 in bonds. Wait a minute. This is too much for me. Where did he go then? He, he went inside the house to get his things. Oh, then it was when he came out again that he was shot. I've got to see Selma. Will you come with me? Come on. No, no, you don't. Stay right where you are, the both of you. What is this? Who are you? Detective Malloy, Homicide Squad. We've had our eye on you, buddy. Trying to make a getaway, huh? Are you crazy? Listen, someone's been kidding you, officer. Sure. Maybe you were kidding, too, when you were seen throwing that gun into the river. David! It's all right. There's been a mistake. Uh, tell Selma, will you? All right. Come here, sister. You're not telling anybody anything. You're going along with us. Where? Down to headquarters. Oh. <laughs> oh, you don't understand. I'm Mrs. Nick Charles. Oh, yeah? And I'm Mother Goose. Come on, step on it. Hello, Nick. Yeah? This is Abrams down at headquarters. Oh, uh, hi. Say, Nick, we picked up a woman a few minutes ago in David Graham's apartment. She claims she's your wife. My wife? Yeah. Says her name's Nora. What about it, Nick? Nora, Nora. Oh, sounds like a phony to me. You better put her in the jug to like it down there. You're the doctor, Nick. In the jug she goes. Right down here, Mr. Charles. Thank you, Matron. Nick! Nick, here I am, over here. Well, hello. <laughs> Fine way 
to start the new year, getting thrown in the can. Nicky, get me out of here. How long has this thing with David been going on? Oh, Nick, stop that and get me out of here. I've got something to tell you. About the case? Yes. Oh, oh, no. I'll get you out on one condition. No more cases. No more detecting. Promise? But this is important. You want me to let her out, Mr. Charles? Definitely not. Nicky, please. Well, promise? I promise. All right, let her out, Nathan. Nick, have you been working on the case? I've been giving it my undivided attention. What have you found out? Nothing. Oh, Nick. The only new development is that Polly has a brother. Where, we don't know. What about her and Dancer and Lum Key? All in the neighborhood at the time of the shooting. We've established that, but we can't prove a thing. But, Nick, somebody killed him. Yes, I think that's been proved. Mrs. Charles? Yes? Lieutenant Abrams wants you for questioning. Questioning? Nicky, they don't think I'm mixed up in this. Don't worry, darling. If they find you guilty, I'll write you every day. This way, please. Nicky! Now tell me, Mr. Graham, were you and Robert Landis on good times? Decidedly not. On bad times, Mr. Graham? Very bad. You and Mrs. Landis were once engaged, weren't you? Until Landis came along? Yes. Ever ask her to divorce him and marry you? I may have. But she never said she would. But you hoped she would. And you thought that with him out of the way, she might. I didn't kill Robert. No, of course not. But you did pay him to go away. Yes. Lieutenant Abrams? My wife. Oh, come on in. I got to ask her some questions, Mr. Charles. I'm sorry. Quite all right. Go ahead. Now, Mrs. Charles, why did you go to Mr. Graham's apartment? What? What? Uh... Uh, maybe I'd better leave. No. Selma had a silly idea that David thought she killed Robert. She wanted me to tell him that she didn't. Why, I can't imagine how she could think a thing like that. It's ridiculous. I haven't seen her for a couple of days. Here's Mrs. Landis, boss. No. Will you come in, Mrs. Landis? David. Oh, I didn't want you dragged into this. Oh, no. It's all right, dear. Mrs. Landis, why did Mr. Graham think you killed your husband? I never said that. I never thought it for one minute. Don't, David. He had every right to think I did it. He's just trying to protect me. He heard a shot. He rushed up to me and saw me standing near Robert with a gun in my hand. But I didn't fire the shot. It came from the street. You mean you didn't kill him? No, look at the gun, David. It hasn't been fired. Oh, Selma, forgive me. No, of course I forgive you. Well, that's all cleared up. Go on, Nora. It isn't cleared up as far as I'm concerned. I've got to have something more than that. Where's that gun, Mrs. Landis? I've got to see that gun. Well, I haven't got it. Why? Well, David took it from me. David, where's the gun? What is it, David? Selma, I thought you were guilty. I thought I was doing the only thing. I, I threw it away. You threw it away? I threw it into the river. Oh, that's marvelous. Well, take it and get it. I'll show them where I threw it. I'll get divers to go down after it. They'll find it. They must. Chloe, she don't want that gun back any more than you do. Hey, Mac, swear out a warrant for the arrest of Mrs. Robert Landis on suspicion of murder. <laughs> something about scrambled eggs? Uh, no, no, I didn't. Uh, I suppose that means you'd like me to go up and fix some for you. Oh, no. I don't care about them. Sure. Really? Good. Good night. Good night. After all, if I want scrambled eggs, I can get them for myself. Of course, I'm not as good a cook as you are, but... Oh, well, don't bother about me. You go on sleeping. I love to watch you sleep. You look so cute. Nicky, have you any pictures of yourself taken as a baby? Mm, no. Oh, that's a shame. I wanted to see what you looked like. I'll have one taken in the morning. Poor Selma. Poor David. Nicky, can you reach the water? Huh? Oh. Yes, I suppose so. Yes. Oh, I didn't want it. I just wanted to be sure you could reach it. <laughs> Nora, please go to sleep. I can't. I keep thinking of Selma down in that jail. Darling, there's nothing to worry about. Tomorrow they'll find the gun. They won't even fired. Selma will be free. Then you don't think she did it? For the tenth time, no. You're not saying that just to make me happy. Mm. You really mean it? Yeah, I mean it. Of course you're right. She didn't do it. She couldn't have done it. I don't think I'd kill you if you ran off with another woman. Mm. Thank you, darling. I might, though. No, uh, don't be morbid. Go to sleep. <laughs> what in the name of... Nick, the window. Keep your head down. Nick, somebody smashed the window. No, really? 
Look, there's a rock with a note attached to it. Take your note. Let's see. What is it, Nick? What does it say? Mm. Silly little woman, I told her to stop writing to me. Oh, darling. Please, read it. Mr. Nick Charles, if you want to know something about the murder of Robert Landis, get a line on Phil Burns, the guy Polly says is her brother. He's an ex-con and was married to Polly in Topeka, Kansas, three years ago. Married three years ago? What are we supposed to do, send him an anniversary present? Look at the way this fellow spells Topeka, (laughs) T-O-P-E-K-E-R. What's the matter with that? Nothing, darling. Good night. Oh, Nick, you can't go back to sleep now. Phone Abrams. What, and have him here, keeping us up all night? Oh, don't you see? If Phil is her husband, then he shot Robert because he found out about him and Polly. Oh, Nicky, you've got to call him. Uh, just as you say. You hand me the phone. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Everything's working out beautifully. All we have to do is find this fellow Phil Burns, and we've got the murderer. Here, darling, call him and tell... Now, who can that be? Oh? Hello, Nick. This is Abrams. Oh, I was just going to call you. Yeah? Well, maybe you better get down here. You know that guy, Phil Burns, Polly's brother? Yeah, what about him? We traced him to his hotel. You find him? Yeah, but somebody else found him first. He's been murdered. Well, there he is. That's the way we found him, Nick. Dead for two hours at least. Strangled. Yeah, looks like he was beaten up a bit before the strangling set in. Any fingerprints? All over the place. We're checking on him now. Mm, what else did you find? Nah, nothing much. He had a thirty-eight in his drawer, six bullets in it, and a little dough. Oh, yeah, and this key. I guess it's the key to Polly's apartment. It's got her number stamped on it. Another good guess would be that Solomon Landis didn't do this. Mm, fair enough. But he wasn't killed the way Landis was either. Might be a good idea to check the chambers on that thirty-eight. He might have fired it and slipped in a new shell. Okay. Anything else on your mind? Uh, yes. That key to Polly's apartment. Could I borrow that for an hour? Sure. Here. Maybe you better give me a skeleton key, too, just for good measure. Okay. What are you looking for? I have the faintest idea. Just a hunch. Call you later. Okay. Nick, what did you find in there? Dead man. Is that all? Isn't that enough? Where are we going now? Well, I don't know about you. I'm going to visit Polly Burns. At this time of night? Without a chaperone? Nora. This is purely business. For me, too. Come on, darling. She's not home. Miss Burns keeps late hours, doesn't she? Mm. Nick, where'd you get that key? From Abrams. It was in Phil Burns' pocket. Oh, it's good you had an answer for that. Go on in. Be quiet. Here's a light switch. You turn it on. What do you expect to find in here? I don't know. Well, how do I know what to look for? Don't look for anything. Go over there and sit down. Suppose she comes in. What do we do? Tell her it's a surprise party. Anything in the drawers? Yeah, give me a chance. Nick, what do you suppose people want a hole in the ceiling? They don't. Some people do. Look up there. Where? Up there. See. In the corner. A little hole in the plaster. What could that mean? Well, it might mean that the ceiling's falling down, or it might... What? What's the number of this apartment? Uh, 3D. I wonder who lives in apartment 4D. Let's go upstairs and find out. Here it is. 4D. This is right over Polly Burns' apartment. What's the name on the bell? Uh, Anderson. Say, where did you dig up all these keys? We're going to visit Mr. Anderson. Or Miss Anderson. It doesn't say which. Anybody home? Put on the light. Let's see. That hole in the ceiling downstairs was right under this corner. If I'm right, these floorboards ought to be loose. Uh Uh-oh. I get it. Somebody took this apartment so they could see what went on downstairs. Exactly. Look through the hole, Nicky. What do you see? Well? That's funny. What is it? I can't see anything. It's... The hole's been plugged up from the other side. What? But how... There's somebody down there now. Somebody who knows about this peephole. Whoever it is, plugged it up while we were coming upstairs. Nick! You stay here. No, Nick, it may be the murderer. Nicky, wait. Let's see who it is. Listen. 
Whoever it is just left. I can hear him going downstairs. Nick, let him go. Now, well, we better catch him before he gets to the street. Nick, wait for me. Well, did you see who it was? No. He went through that door at the end of the hall. That must go to the cellar. Wait here and don't move. Nick, be careful. It's black as pitch down there. Right back, darling. Would you like to come on upstairs? Or do I have to come and get you? All right. Have it your way. Come on, I can see you over there. Come on out or I'll... Nick! Nick, are you all right? I'm okay. Come on down. I can't see. Nicky, did he get you? No, but I didn't get him either. He got out through a window over there. Oh, darling. I was so scared. Where are you? Oh, put your arms around me, darling. Are you sure you're all right? Oh, Nicky, you're bleeding. What are you talking about? I'm not bleeding. Nick, where are you? I'm here. Well, well, then who's this man over here? You have just heard Act Two of After the Thin Man with William Powell and Myrna Loy. During this brief intermission before Mr. DeMille presents Act Three, we bring you another story about Mary. She's washing dishes. Oh, boy, is she mad. I say, look at her hands. They're all red. And coarse. Here, let's see your soap, Mary. Oh, it's harsh. And soap that's harsh pecks away at your hands. No wonder they're red and rough. Here's a friendly tip. Try New Quick Lux. It's so kind to your hands. So mild, so pure. I want you to hear about our one-hand test of five dishwashing soaps, including Lux. Now, here's the story in the words of one of the women who took the test. This is Hugh Rennie of New York. She says... For 20 minutes, three times a day, and that's just about the time I spend doing my own dishes, I dip one hand in Lux suds and the other in suds from another soap. Mrs. Rennie took that test for several weeks under conditions similar to home dishwashing. She goes on to say, At the end of the test, my Lux hand was still nice and smooth, while the other hand was coarse and red. I hadn't realized there was such a difference in dishwashing soaps. I'll never use anything but Lux. Hundreds of women took that one-hand test with similar results. It proved Lux kindest to hands. Try it yourself and see. Ask for the generous large box of New Quick Lux tomorrow and use it for dishes every day. It's so thrifty. Even in hard water, it gives more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of ten other leading soaps tested. It's fast, too. Yet it costs you no more. Remember, New Quick Lux in the same familiar box. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on Act Three of After the Thin Man. In the thick blackness of the cellar, Nora has bumped into a man she thought was Nick. Now she discovers her mistake, and Nick rushes to her side. With quick, tense fingers, he strikes a match. There, in the wavering light, a man stands, propped against the wall. As they stare at his gleaming white face, He slumps to the floor at their feet. Nick! All right, take it easy. What's the matter with him? Is he... is he... Yeah. He's dead. Shot. But when... when was he... I've seen that man before. You know him? Who is he? Light another match. Quick. Well? Of course I know him. 
His name is Pedro Dominguez. He used to be my father's gardener about six years ago. Your father's gardener? Well, that does a lot of good. Come on, we better call Abrams. <laughs> Out, Lieutenant. Was I right about his name? Yes, you were, Mrs. Charles. Pedro Dominguez. <clears throat> but he wasn't a gardener anymore. He was janitor of this building. Probably shot about five hours before you found him. But he's a very funny thing. Go ahead. We could stand a laugh right now. The telephone company tells us that about 11.30 last night, that'd be just before he was shot, someone here called up information and asked for Nick Charles' number. Our number? What would Pedro Dominguez be calling Nick for? I don't know. Do you, Nick? I can't imagine. I haven't even heard his name for six years. Did you remember him when you saw his face? No. That's funny, seeing he used to be Mrs. Charles Gardner. Who remembers a gardener unless he squirts a hose at you? Did you recognize him right away, Mrs. Charles? I had to look twice. He's a lot grayer than he used to be. Hey, by the way, what did you find out about the person in the apartment over Polly Burns? Not a thing. Not a fingerprint in the place. Not a stitch of clothes. Only a hunk of lead pipe and a ladder. Piece of lead pipe and a ladder. Well, that's interesting. Anything in Pedro's books? No, just that someone named Anderson took the apartment a week ago, paid cash in advance. Mm, that's all, huh? That's all. And the name is Anderson. No front name. No Mr., Mrs., or Miss. That's just dandy. You know, I got a feeling that if we could just find out who took that room, we might have our murderer. Well, what do you think we ought to do? Get them all together in the Anderson apartment. Everyone that's mixed up in this. Let's shake them all up and see what happens. You're on. Are you going to take the murderer tonight? Yeah, we're going to try. How are you going to do it, Nicky? I haven't the slightest idea. I'm just going to listen. Pray that somebody makes a slip. Just one slip. Lieutenant, get them all here. All set and waiting, Nick. Picked up Dancer and Lump Key at the lychee. Polly was with them. Then there's that David Graham guy and your wife's cousin, Selma Landis. Anyone else? Yeah. A fat dame they call Aunt Catherine. I brought him along for luck. Uh, swell. Oh, say, before you go in, I checked Phil Burns' apartment. Dancer's fingerprints were all over the joint. Dancers? You sure? Sure, I'm sure. You haven't told him, have you? Not yet. All right, don't. What's your plan, Nick? Build up a case against each of them. Throw all we've got at them and throw it hard enough to bounce. I'll make it bounce all right. And keep them talking. Nick, come on. The party's getting dull. Coming? Evening. Shut that door, please, Lieutenant. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask, ask you all down here because we've just found that another murder has been committed. He's a man I think you all know. Pedro Dominguez. Pedro killed? Yes. What do you know about it, Polly? Nothing. I only saw him a couple of times when I went down to pay my rent. What about you, Dancer? You're in and out of this apartment. You must have known him. Sure, I know him. So what? You, Lumkey? I never been in this house before. You knew him, Selma. I? Well, no, I don't think you I... You remember Selma. He was our gardener six years ago. Oh. David, you remember Pedro Dominguez? Yes, vaguely. A man with long white mustaches. What did you know about him, Mr. Graham? Nothing. That was six years ago. I haven't seen him since. Nicholas, I can't see what possible connection this can have with us. It's very simple, Aunt Catherine. You see, Pedro and Robert were both shot with the same gun. Oh, now, there was some monkey business going on we want to find out about. It seems that one week ago, Pedro rented an apartment to someone calling himself or herself Anderson. Did you ever see this Anderson, Polly? No. Did you ever hear anyone in the apartment just over you? No. I thought not. This Anderson intended to climb down into your apartment one night with the aid of a ladder... And polish off Robert with this lead pipe. Then he was going to climb up to his place again and leave you holding the bag for Robert's murder. Now, do you know anyone who would be interested enough in you to do that? Why, uh, no. You're Dancer's girl, aren't you? I work for him. That's not what he asked. Well? Did Dancer know that you were going away with Robert? Why, Come why? on, come on. You told us before. You said you'd keep that a secret. I'll never trust a cop again. If you made a dicker with the police, okay, Polly. But that letter stuff's a lot of malarkey, Nick. No one did come down that ladder, and Landis wasn't killed in her place. The only reason the murderer didn't kill him that way was because he was found out. Pedro came in yesterday to clean up Anderson's apartment and discover the loose boards on the floor. He didn't like the looks of things, so he put a new lock on the door. 
When Anderson came in, he found he was locked out. He heard Pedro telephoning me, and he killed him. So what? So? Who is Anderson? I'll bite. Who? Polly. Phil had a key to your apartment, and Dancer had one. Yeah. Who else? Nobody. He's trying to hang this murder up on us to protect his own family. That Selma dame. She knocked her husband off. Everybody knows that. I didn't. And I then didn't. you got your boyfriend, David, to throw away the gun. That's a lie. Now, just a minute, please. Look, Dancer, let's come clean. You and Polly and Lum Key were out to shake Robert Landis down for 25 grand, right? Oh, sure. Then I suppose I knock him off and stir up all this fuss before I get the dough. What kind of a stumble bum does that make me out to be? You're the kind of a stumble bum that left your fingerprints all over the room when you killed Phil Burns. Phil? Phil's dead? Yes, strangled. Well, I didn't do it. Then why did you go to his place? Because I thought he'd gummed up my game. I figured he'd try to stick up Landis and had to kill him. So I pushed him around a little to learn the manners. And when I left him, he had a split lip and a couple of dents in him. But he was just as much alive as you are, if that means anything. Polly, who knew Phil was your husband? What? You were married, weren't you? Yeah, but... So Phil was your husband. As if you didn't know. I never knew till now. But I wish I had, Polly. Didn't you ever tell anyone that you were married, Polly? No. Would Phil have told? No. Did you and Phil talk about it? Yeah, one night last week. But no one could have heard. We were alone, down in my room. Alone? Don't forget Anderson could hear everything that went on in your room. Lieutenant, when was Phil Burns killed? Oh, about two, near as we can figure at 3.30, Anderson threw this note in at my window. He was beginning to use some of the information he'd gathered while he was up here. Dancer, how do you spell Topeka? None of your business. Uh, this note is a poor attempt at illiteracy. The easy words are spelled wrong and the tough one's right. Like to see it, Lumkey? It was meant just to steer me down to Phil's place to find his body and your fingerprints, Dancer. Someone's framing you, Dancer. Yeah? You say you don't know this Pedro, Lumkey? No. Well, I've got a picture of him right here. This picture was taken about six years ago when... Nick, what is it? Nothing. Except... Except that all this time I've been waiting for someone to make a slip. And someone has made it. Who? We've been wrong. This wasn't a killing for money. It was a murder of hatred. Revenge. Polly... What did Phil go to the pen for? Blackmail. Blackmail. David, when were you supposed to give Robert the money to go away? This morning. In cash? Yes. But when he decided to go last night, you had to give him bonds? Yes. Where were you going to get cash on New Year's Day? A bank holiday? Funny, I forgot about that. No, you didn't, David. You never meant to give Robert that money. You didn't want him to go away. You wanted to kill him. You were going to get even with him for taking Selma away from you. Nora, is he fooling? Sure. And you were fooling when you said you hadn't seen Pedro for six years. You said Pedro had long white mustaches. Well, he's got long white mustaches now. But look at this picture. There he is six years ago. His mustache was neither white nor long. You didn't notice him six years ago any more than I did. You remember him as he was last night when you shot him. You killed him... And then you killed Robert. Phil saw you do it. He was going to blackmail you, so you had to kill him, too. And then you threw that note in my window. Hope he could put me off your trail. David! David, don't let him say these terrible things. Tell him it isn't true. Ask him why he threw away your gun, Selma. He knew it hadn't been fired. He knew you only had to show it to prove your innocence. Yet he threw it away. Ask him why he did that. David! David, why don't you speak? Wasn't it because you hated her as much as Robert? Wasn't it because you wanted to get even with her, too? Wasn't it because you wanted to see her hang for Robert's murder? David. Tell her the truth now, David. You don't have to pretend anymore. That is the truth. I've hated you, Selma and Robert, ever since you threw me over for him. I've been watching, waiting for the time when I could get even with you for having ruined my life. I did kill Robert, but not the way I wanted to. It was too easy, too quick. I wanted to see him suffer the way he'd made me suffer. And you... And you, I wanted to see you go gradually madder and madder as the day came when you were going to hang. Well, I'm not going to see you hang. But I'm still going to see you die. Get out of that gun. Don't be a fool, Dad. Get out of the way. I've got six bullets. One for her and one for myself. And the rest for anyone who tries to stop me. Get out of the way, Charles. Go get out of my way. I get him, I get him. Okay, Graham. I'll take that gun now. Nice work, Lumkey. Nice work. Nick, he saved you. 
And you sent his brother up. Oh, sure. Mr. Charles sent him up. Number one detective. I'm not like my brother. I like his girl. I'm your friend. Oh, you bet you. <laughs> Tired, darling? Not very. Well, can you believe it? We're alone. No reporters, no friends, no surprises. I suppose we really should decide where we're going. Oh, do you care? No, but I haven't any clothes. All the better. You won't have to pack. All I need in the world is you and a toothbrush. Hey, what's that you're doing? I'm knitting something. Oh, you haven't gotten very far with it. Mm, yes, I have. There. It's done. Done? Why, it... Hey, that looks like... Is that a baby's sock? <laughs> and you call yourself a detective. Why, Mrs. Charles. Draw the curtain on After the Thin Man. In a moment, Mr. DeMille returns with our stars. While we're waiting, let's talk about babies. You know, families often speculate on the chances of the stork bringing twins or triplets. Well, uh, here are some figures that may interest you. The chances of having twins is about 1 in 84. Of having triplets, 1 in 7,500. That makes triplets a pretty rare occurrence. Mrs. Frances Bardall of Holbrook, Massachusetts, was one of the mothers who drew the lucky number in 1939, and she's doubly lucky now because she has new quick lucks to help her in caring for her three small babies. She says, The triplets have such sensitive skins, I wouldn't dream of washing their clothes in harsh soaps or rubbing them with cake soap. I just won't take chances on having woolens or diapers getting rough and scratchy. She's a wise mother, isn't she? She goes on to say, New Quick Lux is so mild and gentle. It's the only thing I'd use for the baby's clothes. It's so safe for everything, safe in water alone. I can depend on it never to make woolens harsh and scratchy or fade the pretty colors of little dresses and sunsuits. Yes, New Quick Lux is so wonderfully gentle and so easy to use, too, so fast. In water as cool as your hand, it dissolves three times as fast as any of ten of the leading soaps tested. Ask for the generous big box of New Quick Lux tomorrow. It comes in the same familiar package and costs you no more. Here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. As Bill Powell and Myrna Loy return to the microphone, we offer our congratulations to the thin man on some first-class detective work. Cecil, you're seldom wrong, but I'll have to mark that one up against you. Hmm? However, if it's any consolation... Everybody makes the same mistake. Brace yourself for a shock, Mr. DeMille. Bill is not and never was the thin man. He isn't. He never has been. Mercy Manor, can't we even believe what we see in the movies? Just for the record, the thin man was murdered in the first thin man picture. We haven't seen him since. Except in the title, where he seems amazingly healthy. <laughs> What's in the name? Call the picture by any name you like, so long as you and Bill remain as our favorite detectives. What's going to happen next to Nora and Nick? Well, there's another Thin Man picture planned, but we haven't started making it yet. It's called The Shadow of the Thin Man. Very promising manhunt. Mm -hmm. I have entire confidence in both of you. Uh, by the way, Cecil, didn't I hear you say that you're going to do Showboat next week? You certainly did, Bill, and we are. Who's going to be in your cast, Mr. DeMille? We'll have Irene Dunn, Alan Jones, and Charles Winninger. They were all in the cast of the motion picture... And they'll all be here on this stage to bring us the exciting drama of Showboat and the great song hits by Jerome Kern. We embark at the usual time next Monday night for this cruise of adventure and romance along the Mississippi. And we hope you'll all be on board. Showboat is practically a command to listen. Good night, Cecil. Good night. Good night. Good night. We'll call you two on another case soon. Sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night. 
when the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn, Alan Jones, and Charles Winninger in Showboat. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Julie Bannon as Selma, Fred Mackay as David, Edward Marr as Abrams, Mary Lou Simpson as Polly, Warren Ash as Dancer, Wally Mayer as Lum Key, and Arthur Q. Bryan, Abe Reynolds, Walter White, Inez Seabury, Tristan Coffin, Eric Snowden, Russell Fillmore, Lou Merrill, and Fred Shields. The American Red Cross needs millions of dollars for European war relief work. They're asking for your contribution now, anything you can give. The place to give, your local Red Cross chapter. The time, as soon as you possibly can. William Powell and Myrna Loy appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. They will soon be seen together on the screen in If I, I Love You Again. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. <laughs> Columbia Broadcasting System. is a smart guy. It takes a smart guy to be that stupid. 2,000 plus. Science fiction adventures from the world of tomorrow. The years beyond 2000 A.D. 2,000 plus presents The Brooklyn Brain. I want to thank you for a very nice evening. The pleasure was all mine, Clarice. I'd have you come up on me if you after 12 and pause asleep. That's all right. Well, good night, Joe. Uh, Clarice? Yeah, Joe. You had a good time, huh? I mean, really. Good night, Joe. Oh, well, wait a minute, Clarice. I, I... I got something to ask you. No. No what? No kiss. I gave you one in the helicopter bus. I am not distributing my favors with largesse. Boy, you certainly know big words. <laughs> That's because I try to give myself culture. Every day in the facsimile newspapers, I do the crossword puzzles. Well, sure, Clarice. I, I think that's fine, only I... I, I got something to ask you. I told you. That isn't you. what I mean. Something else? Clarice, will you marry me? I mean, that is... Will you? This is so sudden... She have known you three years. That ain't so sudden. Well, a, a girl likes to get proposals, but matrimony, oh, that's a very important thing. It, it should not be entered into lightly. I got a good job, a good future. It isn't that, Joe. What isn't that? I mean, oh, like they say in psychology. I don't know what you're talking about, Clarice. That's what I mean, Joe. You don't understand things like psychology. I always read the Handy Hints for Mental Health column. It's written by a psychologist. From such pursuits, I have learned that culture is what counts in life or marriage. The partners have to have a, a mental affinity for each other. Mental? Take Sam Witzenberg. He knows about music. Or Fred Daniels. He knows about art. Or, or take Harry Lester. He knows economics. He knows economics? I had a loan of five dollars. What has money got to do with it, huh? Joe, leave us not quarrel. Yeah, but I... You I'm... have paid me a very high honor by asking me to be your wife. But I can't say yes. Oh, you mean... On the other hand, I didn't say no. 
I, uh, I can't pretend I don't like you, Joe. You're basically a nice boy. Only if... Oh, if you'd only get some culture, learn about things so we could have something to discuss, to talk about. Art? Music? Economics? Or similar high-class subjects. Joe, see what you can do. Okay, Clarice. I'll... I'll try. And then I'll let you know. Sure. And... Joe. Yeah? In light of the circumstances, I, uh... I rescind my previous refusal. What does that mean? It means you can have a good night kiss. Are you, uh, are you ready, Carl? Yes, Professor. Now, remember, after I throw the switch, it will take several seconds for the accumulator to build up. When the red light on the control panel flashes, you throw your contact lever. I understand. Oh, all right. Uh, all right. One, two, three. It's working, Professor. It's working. Oh, good. Excellent. Uh, try it again. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, Carl. Turn it off. I've checked every dial, every meter, as the machine was running. And they all coordinated precisely. Then it will work on a human being. Are you sure enough to let me try it on you? Uh, well, uh, it isn't that, Professor. It's just that uh, you kind of need me to help you run the machine. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I, I understand, Carl, and... And since I am the inventor, it would also be foolish for me to volunteer to be the first human guinea pig. Uh, well, obviously, we need, we need someone else to try it on. And that's right, Professor. Imagine. Eleven years' work. Here is a machine that takes a tape recording of a human voice reading facts, figures, to anything, and transforms it from sound waves into electrical waves. Then, through electrodes attached to a human head... Charging that brain with the wave so that automatically the person getting the electrical shock has information charged into his memory. It will be a boon to education. Oh. People won't have to go to school anymore. Your brainwave machine will just charge their brains with anything they want to know. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there's a lot of experimenting we have yet to do, but uh, so far as we can know up to this moment, the machine should work, uh, I hope. Now, uh... Whom are you going to try it on? Oh, yes, whom? Well, we'll, uh, we'll run an ad. We'll try and find someone, not too bright, but uh, someone we can try to transform into a mental giant. This is Joe. We sent him six dozen boxes like he ordered. Ten day billing. Yes, Charlotte, ten for it right away. Flora, take a letter. The boss ain't got a check from St. Louis, and he's mad. It doesn't pay to be mad. It's not good for customer relations. To whom is the letter going? Uh, dear sir. Uh, dear sir, who? Aren't you feeling well? Gosh, I don't know, Flora. I guess my mind ain't on my work. Where is it? I'm going to Clarice's Thursday night for dinner. She's your girl. And she'll make you happy. Be happy. But she's having Sam Witzenberg for dinner, too, and he's got culture. You got a job. Flora, you're a smart girl. You know how to find things in the files. Tell me, how do I learn about things? How do I get culture? Study. How much time have I got? Thursday is three days from now. What can I learn in that time? Not culture. That's what I mean. I'm licked before I start. I have a teacher. That's expensive. So stay a bachelor. But I don't want to. Oh, look. Look, here's a newspaper. I'll turn to the educational section. Let me see. Here it is. Here it is. Friends.
French. Well, I learn French. What would I do with French? What would you do with culture after you get married? Look, I, I I'm don't... only trying to be helpful. Go on, Flora. What else is there? Uh, how to hypnotize in nine easy lessons. Hey, that's interesting. If you learn how to hypnotize, I don't work for you anymore. Well, let's see, what's this? Be a mechanic. Learn the soul of a machine. Soul of a machine? <laughs> Crazy. Oh, here's another ad. Uh, well, what does it say? Let me see. If you would like to learn any subject in the world without effort and are willing to volunteer for a scientific experiment, write to Box 1934, the facsimile times. Hey, I don't like that volunteer for scientific experiment part. But it also says, if you would like to learn any subject in the world without effort. Do you, do you think I should write them? All you lose is a stamp. Use a company stamp, you lose nothing. Okay. So since I'll never get culture, just wish you for it. Take a letter. Dear sir. We start that again? Dear sir, who? Dear sir, box 1934, the facsimile times. In response to your advertisement, permit me to say that I would very much like... <laughs> Have you read these letters from people who want to volunteer for our machine? All six of them. Do you think it's wise to take people with such mentality? Well, it would be a good test for the machine. Yes, but uh, almost any change would be an improvement for them, judging from the letters. Whatever else may be said, Professor, the people who wrote those letters are human beings. Yes, I suppose so. And we need a human being to test with. After all, so far, the only living thing we have used was a dog. Ah, but the dog lived. It proves the machine's electrical charge in the head does not kill. The charge doesn't kill, but does it force knowledge into the brain? We beamed a recording of the Einstein theory into the dog. But the dog can't talk. What good is it to him? But, Carl, doesn't it give you satisfaction to know that because of our invention... There is one dog in this city who actually knows the Einstein theory. Did any dog know the theory before our invention? No. All right. So we have reason to believe the machine will work. That is why we are looking for a human being, just to be sure. But um, which one of these letters, uh, which one of these people shall we take? Well, whichever one has the greatest need for knowledge. They all need it. Yes, but I mean... Uh, Whichever one believes he needs it most, that person will have an incentive to cooperate with us. I see. Well, in that case, this one. Flora, look. I got a letter. They selected me. Congratulations. It says here, please choose your subjects. Art. Music. Economics, that's for me. You should also add another subject. How to get St. Louis to pay its bill. That ain't culture. Who says the lady's garment business is culture? Gosh, Flora, you know what I mean. Like Clarice says, there's more to living than just having a job. You ever try living without a job? Art, music, economics... I'll show Sam Whitsonburg he's not the only one who knows those things. I'll show Clarice, too. Should I call the number on this letter and make an appointment for you? Would you, Flora? Gee, thanks a lot. Okay. Hello? I'm calling for Mr. Joe Martin. You sent him a letter about... Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. He'd like an appointment. Today? Oh, Joe, is today all right? The sooner the better. Mr. Martin is in conference now, but I believe it could be arranged. Yes. Yeah. Uh, art, music, economics. No, no, you pick one for today. To him, it makes no difference. Yeah. Thank you. Well? Is the address after 12 o'clock today? You'll have culture. Now, Mr. 
Mr. Martin, if you'll just lie down here on this surgical table. Surgical table? Uh, I didn't come for an operation. I came for an education. Oh, and you shall get one, my boy. You shall get one. <laughs> After today, you'll be an expert on art. <laughs> you know, painting and sculpture and all that sort of thing. Uh, lie down, please. Uh, what are you going to do? Well, you see, Mr. Martin, you have brain waves. I have? Everybody has. You see, the brain gives us power, that's why. Now, what we do, uh, well, to describe it simply, is play a recording of some subject you want to learn. Now, the sound waves are transformed into electrical waves and are charged into your brain. The result is, you have the knowledge impressed into your mind. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I just remember I got another appointment. Oh, no, 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 Mr. No, no. Martin, in your letter you said you wanted to show your girl that you could uh, learn things, be smart. Get culture? Uh, where did I put my head? Here or there? Uh, your head up here, your feet down there. <laughs> splendid, splendid. Now, uh, Carl, attach the electrodes to his head, will you? Yes, Professor. Oh, well, I... You will never know what hit you. Uh, I mean, no, not at all, not at all. Just uh, relax, Mr. Martin. Everything is ready, Professor. All right, Carl. One, two, three. Now, 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 it's just warming up, Mr. Vardy. Don't be so nervous. <laughs> no, sir. Shall I start the recording now? In, in one moment. Uh, you see, Mr. Martin, Carl will start the recording that he dictated this morning, and then I'll charge the knowledge into your brain. <laughs> you see? Begin the recording. Yes, Mr. Martin. Among the new school of paintings which have excited modern critics and which are likely to have a profound effect upon future interpretive forms, the new circular school of impressionistic painting is outstanding. And now, for the charge. Employing vibrant... How is he, Professor? Is he all right? Oh, he's a little glassy eye. Maybe we'd better stop the experiment. Uh, no, no, no. We, we, we'll try it once more. Only speed up the recording so we can charge his brain more quickly. All right, if you say so. Here it goes. Coordinate relationships which stimulate the senses and excite the imagination. The secular school manages to get around traditional obstacles of comprehensibility. Your latest form to the secular school of impressionistic painting began on Martinelli. Now, the charge. Another school which has managed to repeat. Now, that's enough. That's enough, Carl. Uh, shut up the equipment. He, uh, is alive, isn't he? I, uh, I think so. Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin. Uh, oh, wake up, Mr. Martin. He's uh, coming to. What? Oh, what happened? Oh, is, is it over? Yes, that's all for today. And I... And I got culture? So far as we know, everything seemed to work. I got a headache, too. Would you like a glass of water? No, I... I think I'd better go now. I gotta get back to work. So, so long, fellas. Professor, should we have let him go like that? Uh, let's uh, look out of the window. Ah, there he is. Mm. Just came out of the door onto the street. He's a little wobbly. Maybe a cop will think he's drunk. Uh, frankly, I'm a little worried about him. I wonder if the experiment really worked. I'm worried about him, too. Because... Even if the experiment did work, we speeded the record up so fast. Good heavens, Professor, what if he ends up talking like Donald Duck? <laughs> oh, Sam, you play the piano so beautifully. Sam Lichtenberg is not known as the Beethoven of Brooklyn for nothing. I know exactly what you mean. When Mabel Baker said you look like a bum, you never got a haircut, I said it's because you're autistic. Not getting a haircut, I mean. Oh, excuse me, there's the doorbell. More company? It's probably Joe. That peasant. Now, Sam, don't you and Joe start anything. Hello, Clarice. Come in, Joe. Nice party. I hope you like it, Joe. Clarice, have you 
made up your mind yet? Uh, made up my mind? You know, Clarice, about us. Uh, Joe, this is not the place to pursue that question. Well, I just thought that maybe if you... I, I don't know yet, Joe. Uh, come into the party. Sure, Clarice. Well, 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 if it isn't Joe. How are you, Joe? Hello, Sam. Sam was playing the piano. Yeah, I heard. Read any good books lately, Joe? Well, we're taking inventory at the store, and I, I've been kind of busy. Yeah, Joe works very hard. A hard head? you got to work hard, eh, Joe? The only reason you got a soft head is you got so much hair on it, it's like a mattress. But uh, Clarice says it's artistic. Clarice says... Did... Did you say that? Well, I... Joe, I... I meant he, he looks like an artist. Artist? Wear long hair. And, uh, speaking of artists, Joe, what do you think of the new secular school of impressionistic painting? Well, I... Do you I, think I... the dynamism of the blues is more effective than the interpretive qualities of the vibrant yellows? Well, the, the real... <laughs> <laughs> sure, Joe. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Uh, by the way, Clarice, uh, how about you and I go to the Arts Institute tomorrow afternoon? Oh, that's very nice, Sam, but... Joe... Joe, what's the matter? Sure. Sure, go with him to the Art Institute. Maybe he'll get a job. They'll use him as a hair mop to dust the paintings with. Joe. <laughs> you want to know what I think about the new circular school of impressionistic paintings? I'll tell you. I think the brushwork of Daguerre is infinitely superior to the technique of Martinelli, but that the interpretive approach of both of them is immature. Joe. You're so smart, Sam Whitsonbraid. Let me ask you a few questions. Why does Gregory Thompson, a British Impressionist, conceive all legendary characters in his paintings as cubistic? Why? Well, it's because, uh... It's because, uh... Because, uh... Because, uh... Why, Sam? I don't know. Sam! You don't know? You don't know they're cubistic because Thompson is a cubist and not a circular school at all? You didn't know that, huh? But I... You're a blockhead. So you of all people should know a cubist. Now, let me tell you something else. The important news in art circles is the recrudescence of 19th century painting with particular emphasis on the portraits of that period. In fact, I think I will go myself tomorrow to the Art Institute and just look at that 19th century stuff. <laughs> Would you like to come, Clarice? Joe. Okay. Now, uh, oh, oh, we, we can't go tomorrow. It's Friday. i got to finish in and talk. Oh, that's all right, Joe. We'll go Saturday any time you say, Joe. Okay. But you only go with me to the Art Institute, you understand? Yes, Joe. So, uh, what are you going to do tomorrow, Sam? I, uh, I think I'll get a haircut. <laughs> Hello, Flora. Da, 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 de, de, de. All ready for a morning's work. <laughs> Where's that the file from St. Louis? You feeling all right, Mr. Martin? Great. Like a million dollars. All from culture? Flora, you should have been there. I was so smart. The words were so big, even I couldn't understand what I was saying. That's some education you got. Science is wonderful. Imagine those professors doing what they did to me. They shoot me full of brain waves. One minute I'm a dope, and the next minute I'm an exploit on... On... Uh... Art? Music? Economics? Which one is it? I... I don't remember. That's not good. Let me think. Sam was there. Oh, it, it must have been about art because... Because tomorrow I'm taking Clarice to the Art Institute. If you're going there, you really must have said something. I know, but, but I can't remember what it was. Flora, ask me some questions. Maybe it'll come back to me. Why do you like pictures? I don't know. Yesterday I saw a picture in a magazine. Look like four soap boxes in the junkyard. It was called Sunset in Hawaii. The magazine said it was a cubist picture. Does that make sense to you? No. Couldn't you explain it even if you couldn't understand what you were saying? No. 
You need another shot in the head. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Flora, call the professor to make me another appointment. I, I gotta take Clarice to the Art Institute tomorrow. And I can't remember anything at all. <laughs> Now, now, Mr. Martin, please don't be so nervous. Just answer my questions. But she's my girl. I'm, I'm finally making progress, and this has to happen. Yes, um, Carl, put on the recording again. Let Mr. Martin hear it. Yes, sir. No obstacles to comprehensibility. Among the leading exponents of the circular school of impressionistic painting, Daguerre and Martinelli are perhaps best known. Another school which has managed to retain some influence on contemporary trends, despite the vigorous onslaught of the impressionists, is that group best exemplified by the work of Gregory Thompson, who's an impressionist? There, yeah, now, you remember that, don't you? I don't remember it, and I don't understand it. But we charged your brain with that information. You charged it, you try to collect it. I don't know where it is. Um, Carl, I'd like to talk to you alone for a moment. Excuse us, Mr. Martin. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, sure. You're, uh, you're sure the machine worked properly when we experimented on him? When I dismantled the machine this morning, everything was perfect. But what could have happened? Apparently, it makes only a brief impression on the brain, about 24 to 36 hours. Oh, that's terrible. What's terrible about it? At least we're on the right track. In a year or two, we'll perfect it so people can remember all the time. People! People can learn things even if we don't perfect the machine. But what I most regret is, there's no longer a dog in the whole world who knows the Einstein theory. Well, I'm... Uh... I'm sorry, Mr. Martin, but obviously the experiment wasn't as successful as we had hoped it would be. Well, then give it to me again. Professor, I just kind of know about art. I'm taking Clarice to the Institute tomorrow. Couldn't you take her to a movie instead? But, but I'm not afraid anymore. Put those things on my head again. Give me a man bolt. I like it, I like well, it. Well, I'm, I'm afraid that's impossible. You see, we dismantled the machine. Huh? We're moving it to a laboratory upstate. It will take at least a month until we put it together again. A, a month? But tomorrow... I'm sorry, Mr. Martin. Clarice won't marry me now. Oh, Joe, you're right on time for our trip to the Institute. Oh, I'm so excited. Come in, Joe. Hello, Clarice. We'll see you all the pictures and you'll explain them to me, won't you, Joe? Clarice, there's, there's something I want to tell you. Yes, Joe. It's, it's about my culture, about what I said about art the other day. Oh, Joe, you were wonderful. I thought Sam Woodsonberg had dropped dead. You know what? After you left, he said you knew more about art than anybody he ever knew. He said that? And you were so masterful when you told him you were taking me to the Institute. I... I was... Oh, Joe. Joe, I got something to tell you. You have? I made up my mind. Joe, don't you understand? I made up my mind. I accept your proposal. You mean you... You marry me? That's right, Joe. You got culture. We'll have a mental affinity. Clarice, listen... Let's get married right away, today. Let's not even go to the Art Institute. Oh, but Joe... I can leave an absence. We'll go away on a honeymoon for a month. A month? A whole month. And then when we get back, then we got time for culture. I promise you, after one month, I will absolutely be charged with culture. Oh, Joe, this is so sudden and so romantic. Oh, but I don't have a true, so I need clothes. Look, look, I work in the ladies' garment business. I'll go to the store. I'll get you all those you need. <laughs> Only let's get married and not go to the Art Institute. Oh, Joe, you're so smart. You think of everything. I do? I'll bet you even know the Einstein theory. <laughs> Next week, 2000 Plus presents a thrilling melodrama of adventure and terror. Be sure to listen. 2000 Plus is produced by Dreyer and Winolson Productions, Incorporated. In today's cast, Bryna Raper and portrayed Clarice and Flora, 
Gilbert Mack was Joe, William Keen was Sam, and Mercer McLeod was the professor. <laughs> The orchestra was conducted by Emerson Buckley. Music composed by Elliot Jacoby. Sound, Walt Shaver and Adrian Penner. Engineer, Ed Formica. This is Ken Marvin speaking. program came from New York. From Hollywood. Vinnie Barnes in The Unexpected. The Unexpected. The Unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected. Happy, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true, but dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate. In The Unexpected. Who knows what strange drama may happen tomorrow, or an hour from now, or in just a moment. Who knows what destiny has in store for the lady down the street, the fellow at the next desk, or for you, yourself. Who knows? Listen in just a moment for The Unexpected. And now, Vinnie Barnes, famous motion picture and stage star in a drama of the unexpected, titled, Find the Man. Ah, oh, school was over for that year. Another nine months marked off the calendar. Three months of vacation and then school again. But not for this teacher, no. I'd made up my mind. By next fall, I'd be lighting pipes instead of sharpening pencils. Hunting for collar buttons, not examination questions, and laying out bedroom slippers rather than planning lectures. Yes, by next fall I'd be a different woman. Cora, is that you? I guess so. You're a little late. What were you doing? Buying a bathing suit. Oh, I'd like to see it. Here it is. In that little package? Oh, it's that kind of a bathing suit. Say, what are you up to? Up to? You know very well what I mean. You're planning something. That blue evening dress and that black thing. I can't imagine where you'll wear that. To bed. It's a nightgown. Cora, has something happened to you? Not yet, but I have hope. Could you diagram that sentence, Miss Atkins? I'd be glad to. Subject, Cora Atkins. Verb, tired. Very tired of teaching school. Object, a man. Uh, with a modifier, of course, marriage. You mean you're deliberately going out to try to find a man? To collect a scalp. Exactly. Cora! Well, I have arranged to set my trap for two weeks in an exclusive resort at Owl Lake. I have baited it with three new hats, riding breeches, a cocktail dress, an evening gown, and, two, and a two-piece bathing suit. And you, my dear Gail, will need a different roommate next fall. Uh, I hope. <laughs> The 
The Hoot Inn was large and expensive. The meals were atrocious. The beds were hard and lumpy, but there were men. Lots of men. However, there was also competition. Oh, I just adore this place. It's simply marvelous. Don't you all think so, Miss Atkins, honey? That was Maybelle. She was blonde, petite, wide-eyed, a clinging vine with the strength of a boa constrictor. And she had a way with men, particularly my men. On the first day, I pulled on my riding breeches, strode down to the stables and flicked my shiny leather whip at Stephen Martin, a handsome stockbroker from Cleveland. Why, uh, yes, Mr. Martin, I really do believe I'd enjoy a canter this morning. They say that the view from Elk's Peak is simply breathtaking. <laughs> I've been looking all over for you. The lake's simply wonderful this morning, and I've got my swimming suit on underneath this little, uh, what do you call it? But I'm sort of scared of the deep water. I'd like to have a man along just in case anything should happen. You don't mind, do you, Miss Atkins, honey? That night... I had arranged a charming foursome of bridge. An elderly couple from Boston, a scholarly young archaeologist from Albuquerque, and my new cocktail dress. The cards were dealt, the hand was bid. The archaeologist was digging deep within my eyes when suddenly someone trumped my king. Oh, Clifford, I'm so glad you're dummy. A little group of us are planning to drive into town for the Saturday night dance. And we've just got to have your car. You'll be a sweet potato and take us in, won't you, Clifford? Oh, now, don't you other folks, Fred. I've arranged for dear old Mrs. Pinksom to play instead. She just adores bridge. I had saved the blue evening gown for the hotel dance on Sunday night. All else had failed. But... Blue was my most flattering color. Tony Ginkus was a professional football player with the Tallahassee Goats. As we danced, he held me in his arms like a pigskin, and I waited for the first forward pass. You, uh, you waltz very well, Mr. Ginkus. It's a lovely night. Isn't it, Mr. Ginkus? I said it's a lovely night, isn't it? Eh? Would you, uh, would you like to walk out on the veranda? No. No, I suppose not. Just what the hell are you uh, thinking about at this moment, Mr. Ginkus? Knut Rockney. Oh. Yes, I see. Well, let's not talk anymore. Let's just, let's just sweep on into the night. Don't tell me you've forgotten. Ooh. I'm fearful sorry to drag him away, Cora, but we can't keep the horses waiting. No, I understand. Oh, do you, honey? Well, that's nice. It's a pity you aren't dressed for riding. The first week at Owl Lake was over. My wardrobe and I were exhausted. The following Monday, I put on an inexpensive black print dress that Dean Wilson had approved. Walked out to the veranda and buried my hopes behind MacDougall's development of the 19th century British novel. Good morning. Why, hello. Am I interrupting you? No, no, not a bit. Sit down, won't you? Well, thank you. Uh, you're Cora Atkins, aren't you? Why, why, yes. Yes, I am. How did you know? I asked. Oh. I'm Max Thompson. Why, how do you do, Mr. Thompson? You know, I, I've been watching you for the last week. But today you seem well, somehow more approachable. More like the sort of woman I'd like to know. But perhaps you'd care to join me. I was just heading up toward Elk's Peak. I hear the view is breathtaking. Max Thompson was tall, moderately attractive, quite literate. And in addition, he was extremely attentive. However, 
There were two questions about him that needed answers. A, was he single? And B, how would he react to Maybelle? Oh, question A was answered the next evening as we canoed. Paddling gently toward the far end of our lake. You know, Cora, I've never married. I don't know why. I used to think it was because I'd never met the right woman. And someone with understanding and depth and a certain amount of culture. But now I'm afraid that, that if I met her, she wouldn't have me. Yes, I don't even think I'd have the nerve to ask her. She couldn't want me. What? Why, Cora, you've dropped your paddle. Men worry about the strangest things. But question B was a more difficult problem. And on my last night at Owl Lake, the scent of magnolias wafted over my romance and I shivered with apprehension. Thompson. I've heard all about him, but you know, I've never met him. How could I have overlooked you, Mr. Thompson? I can't imagine. Well, now, Cora, honey, since you're leaving tomorrow anyway, you probably want to get your packing done. I'd just be glad to take Mr. Thompson off your hands. We ought to get better acquainted. Don't you think so, Mr. Thompson? I'm very sorry, Mabel. Yeah. I have something to discuss with Miss Atkins. Maybell melted away and I sat quite still, relishing my moment of triumph. Cora, my dear, this is really a serious moment for us both. We have such a great deal in common. We've had so many wonderful moments here this past week. And they can continue. They should continue. Oh, Cora, they must continue. I relaxed slightly. The crisis was past. I knew then that my days as a schoolteacher were over. You think the story is finished, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. Now for the surprising conclusion to Find the Man, a Hamilton Whitney production written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt and directed by Frank K. Danzig. The moon dipped low and my hopes ran high as Max lit his pipe, sighed and spoke. Well, Cora, as you know, I, well, as you must have guessed, I, I have a proposition. I, I mean, a proposal for you to consider. Now, now, I don't want you to answer hastily. Take all the time you please before you make up your mind. Well, uh, I'm sure it won't be a difficult decision. Well, that's fine. As you may have concluded, I've spent a lot of time this week thinking you over. As a matter of fact, I even had you investigated. What? Oh, please don't be offended. I always do. Well, I... And you've more than justified my hope. Well, I'm glad of that, Max. Cora, this is your... Our last night together at Owl Lake. And I feel it shouldn't be the end of our association. Why, no, Max, of course not. Then I know you'll consider what I have to offer. I haven't told you before, but I'm the superintendent of schools in a small town in Iowa. Oh. As you know, there's a great shortage of teachers, and I... No, th- Max, no, no. Now, my dear Cora, I told you not to be hasty. Why, I'm sure that the salary I can offer will make it more than worth your while to take over as head of our high school English department. Well, that was my summer vacation. Next year, I'm going to Columbia and work toward my master's degree. Or, on second thought, I may make it Vassa.
Find the Man starred Vinnie Barnes. Listen in again soon when another of your favorite motion picture stars meets the unexpected. This program was transcribed in Hollywood. Presented by Wild Root Cream Oil for the Hair. Over the minds of mortal men come many shadows. Shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So in the sudden shadows which fog the minds of men and women are to be found the strange impulses which urge them into the unknown. Dark Venture. Tonight's venture in the dark features William Tracy and is brought to you by the Wild Root Company, makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. But first, a word about a close-up that has nothing to do with the movies. Say, men, how do you check on your appearance before you go to work in the morning? Well, you better make a close-up look in the mirror and see if you need Wild Root Cream Oil. You know, Wild Root Cream Oil helps you make a successful impression. It keeps your hair handsomely and trim, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. And there's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil. What's more, it contains soothing lanolin. And just a little goes a long, long way. So get the big economy-sized bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter, and next time you visit your barber, ask him to use Wild Root Cream Oil on your hair. And now tonight's dark venture, The Only Inhabitant. Come on, I want to talk to you. Come on, come on, you can drop that Chinese. They tell me you can speak English fine. Oh, now I see who you are. Go away. No, you don't. Go away. Look, they tell me you're the wise old grandpa around here. Well, look, grandpa, you're going to tell me what's wrong. You're going to tell me if I have to choke it out of you. What is it you want to know? Here's what I want to know. Why am I poisoned, everybody? You'd think I was one of those guys in the mouthwash ads back in the States. Even my best friends won't tell me. Old Joe said once we get to Harala, everything was going to be Jake. And I sweat my head off getting here and... You've got to tell me what's wrong. All right. I tell you, so you leave us in peace. Come in. So you want the truth, do you? Sure, I want the truth. Why won't this town hide me out? Why won't anybody give me a break? To understand that, young man, you must first understand what has happened to you. Nothing's happened to me. You don't think so? You tell me why you came to this part of the world, then I will explain exactly what has happened to you. Not to that. You're doing the talking, not me. No, my way is the only way I can help you. But listen, I... It is the only way. All right, I'll tell you. Why not? Yeah, maybe just telling it'll make me feel better. 
Before I got in the Army, I was a handy kid back in Ohio. That's in the States. Cleveland, Youngstown, Cincinnati. Hijacking, smuggling stick-ups, anything for a quick buck. And though the cops never nabbed me, the draft board sure did a good job. Yeah, before I could say you can't do this to me, I'm driving a GI truck in Mitkin of China. And one day about a year ago, I was sitting in a dumpy bar room trying to swallow some wormy wine when I feel somebody standing next to me. It was a big guy in a white suit, and he was smiling. If that wine tastes so lousy, why drink it? Here, try some of my scotch, Eddie. Scotch? Hey, how come you know my name? I don't know yours. Mine's Joe Hawkins. A friend of yours who used to work with you back in Ohio told me you were stationed out here. He said, look for a tough little redhead with a chip on his shoulder. Yeah? I got a good deal for you, Eddie. There's a car outside, some civilian clothes, and a couple of fake passports. You won't mind resigning from the Army, will you? I don't get it. They tell me you're a real tough lad. I need somebody like that for my racket. Which is what? Oh, dealing with the natives here in China. Black market, huh? I'm offering you a seat in the gravy train, Eddie. You coming along? What happens if we get nabbed? I got an answer for that, too. The best hideout in the whole world. You coming along? What do you think, Joe? Joe and I worked all the cities and towns in that part of China, and we really rolled in the shekels. We made a good team. Joe could sure figure things out. And me... Well, like Joe said, in his racket, he needed a real tough lad. There's the gas truck, Joe, behind those trees. Right where you told the driver to park it. Yeah, 3,000 gallons of gas. That's 10 grand in the kitty, little man. Come on. 10 grand less a 1,000 for the driver. Yeah. Hey, where is he? Here he is in the cab. He fell asleep waiting for us. The jerk, he could have been nabbed. Better wake him up so we can pay him off and get out of here. Oh, wait. Huh? Don't you have no consideration, Joe? Don't you know it ain't polite to wake a guy from such a nice sleep? This way's better. <laughs> Gotta hand it to you. How do you do it, kid? What do you feel inside? Help me dump him out and let's get out of here. <laughs> Uh, 200 cartons of cigarettes, my friend, just like we promised. Very good. Very good. That'll be $50 a carton, American dough. $50? I beg your pardon, but I was told the price was only $35. Come on, you pay up and stop squawking. I, I pay. I pay. 35 bucks for 10 packs of cigarettes. What do you think this is? Bargain day? Pretty risky, kid, working a boat like this. What do you mean? Smuggling these guys across. They're Jap collaborators. The money's A1, ain't it? Yeah, but... Hey, hey what's that on the shore? Lights. Chinese soldiers, we're in trouble. Yeah, turn off that motor, quick! Hey, what are we gonna do? Those Japs are all down in the hold, ain't they? Sure. And the hatch is locked? Yeah, they're all locked in, you know that. I'm a pretty good swimmer. How about you? Yeah, okay, but... Then give me that axe, quick, before those Chinese turn a machine gun on us. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Hey, Yeti, you're going nuts. You're scuttling the boat. We can swim to shore easy from here. But what about the guys in the hold? Drown like rats. Let's try to turn back. What are you talking about? They've already paid for the trip. Besides, you said they were Jap collaborators, didn't you? What's the matter, Joe? Ain't you patriotic? Yeah, that's how we live, Joe and I. But we ate good and drank good because we could pay for what we wanted. And we got a kick out of life. Just the same, I was human. And there were times when I got the shakes thinking what would happen if the MPs ever nabbed this. But Joe had an answer for that, and it was always the same. Kid, when the going gets tough, we're going to head for a place called Harala. Harala? What's that? According to the maps, it's just a little native village a million miles from nowhere. But like I told you before, it's the best hideout in the whole world for guys like you and me. Then about three months ago, we were in a mangy little town on the border. We found a room in a little hotel and were sleeping off a hard trunk. 
It must have been about three in the morning. Who's there? Military police, open up. Joe! Come on, through the window. Hey, look. Look, there's more of them down there. Where's my gun? Don't be nuts, they'll cut us to pieces. Then what do we do? We open the door like the man says. Day we were in an army transport plane with an MP guard flying back to Mitchell at a stand court marshal. The sky was cloudy and the plane was cold and I was feeling lousy. But why shouldn't I? Going back to what I faced. Then I felt a hand on my shoulder. Eddie, what do you want? Shut up, keep your voice down. I've been watching that guard. He had to stay awake while we were having our snooze. So what? Look at him. He's so tired he can hardly keep his eyes open. Another one of your big plans keep coming your up. Voice down and listen. Can't be more than four or five hundred miles from Harala. There's nobody on the plane but that guard and the pilot. If we work it right, we can take over this plane. What are you talking about? Hey, what are you guys doing over there? Oh, just talking to keep from falling asleep. Yeah, sure makes you drowsy flying this high. Yeah, sure does. Look, look how he's fighting it. Look how he's trying to stay awake. So what if we did take the plane over? A lot of good that would do us. Who'd fly it? Kid, I was flying these things when you were still getting a 2 a.m. feeding. Huh? Look, the guard's just about asleep. Start edging toward him. If he sees us, he'll blow our heads off. Just keep edging up on him. That's it. Easy. Easy. He's awake again. Freeze. Look at his head nodding. Come on. How we find our way to this harrow or whatever it is. Pilot's got maps up there. Don't talk so much. Just keep crawling. Guards in dreamland. Yeah. I grab him. Do it quick, Eddie. Do it quick. Was that quick enough, Joe? Give me his gun. Uh, All right. Come on. All right, Mr. Flyer. Set the automatic pilot and throw your hands up. You've just lost your job. Tied the pilot up and put him in back, and Joe took over. For a couple hours, everything was okay. Then towards night, a storm came up. The sky got darker than I ever saw before. Joe started sweating, and I felt myself going to pieces inside. I tried to hide it, but I couldn't. Where are we? Uh, Stop bothering me. Why don't you tell me the truth? We're lost. You don't know where we are. It's a storm. I can't see nothing, or the compass is all wrong. We're going to crack up. We're going to die, ain't we, Joe? Hey, what's wrong with you? You're the tough guy, remember? I don't want to die, Joe. I don't want to die. Shut up. Hey, hey the right motor's conking out. Joe, how are we going to get out of this? You ain't this way with a gun in your hand on the ground, are you, kid? Joe, don't ride me. Get that pilot to bring him up here. Maybe he can help us out. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll get him. And take this pistol with you. If he gets gay... I started back for the pilot. Then I stumbled over something and banged against the side of the plane. I saw what I stumbled against. The parachutes. The parachutes! Joe, Joe, we can bail out! He couldn't hear me. Nuts to him. I fastened one of the parachutes around me. I wasn't gonna die. The plane was losing altitude all the time. I started for the emergency hatch, trying to batter it open. I had to get out of the plane. I had to get out! And I happened to look back for a second. And I saw the pilot was just sitting watching me with a smile on his face. I raised a gun. He didn't smile after that. I got the hatch open and jumped into the darkness. I must have passed out when I hit the ground. I woke up with a storm gone and the sun shining in my face. Just lying on my back looking around at this... Wilderness. It made me sick inside. All alone in the middle of China, that's all I could think. I climbed to my feet. All alone. I felt myself getting panicky. I... Then I saw something that made me think I was going nuts. No, it was real. About 20 feet from me was a pitcher of water and some bread. I went over to where I saw the bread and water. Footprints in the dirt. 
I didn't care about eating these footprints. I got followed them. I don't know how long it took, but after a while, I was standing on a little hill. And down below, all by itself, was a hut. There didn't seem to be anybody around, but out of the chimney came a trickle of smoke. I took out my gun. I couldn't take chances. I didn't know what I'd find inside that hut. There was no answer to my knock. I pushed it open and held my gun ready. I was just a little bit afraid. At first, I couldn't see anything after coming out of the sun. Then I started to make out wooden furniture and a little stove. And then I saw him. Leave me alone. So this is what I've been afraid of. A small, gray-haired little guy in rags sitting in the corner. And as my eyes became more accustomed to the dark, I saw that one of his arms was gone. I told you, leave me alone. You speak English, huh? That's good. What are you supposed to be, the old man of the mountain? For the last time, leave me alone go away. Uh-uh, I like it here. You're the guy who gave me the bread and water? Yes, I am. And what? Why are you so impolite now? I have a reason. Go and leave me alone. And where shall I go? Chicago, St. Louis, maybe? American airplanes fly over here every day. Go back where you were and spread your parachute. One of them will see you. That wouldn't be so good, mister. But I tell you, you cannot stay here. Do you know where Harala is? Yes, beyond the mountain. How far? Oh, perhaps 400 miles. Uh, how long would it take me to get there? Oh, about three months on foot, if you knew the way. Do you know the way? Yes, Then but... you're taking me. I cannot. You're taking me. Young man, listen. First, I want you to listen. I'm in trouble, bad trouble. If I'm caught, they'll kill me. You know why they're after me? Because I'm not afraid of the only thing I have to do to get what I want. Nobody crosses me, Nobody. The toughest guys in the world have tried it, and they didn't get away with it. I don't care what your reasons are, but if you can't take me to Haral, I'll kill you. Now, what were you going to say? Nothing. If I told you the truth, as you say, you'd kill me, and even I am afraid to die. Okay, that's settled then. I'll take you to Haral. Good. Because you're an evil man and must be destroyed. Yeah? And who's going to do it? A one-armed little guy like you? Yes, me. You may have had your way with everyone else you've met. But on the road to Halala, I, the weakest man who ever crossed your path, will destroy you. We'll return to our story as soon as Harry Wallstrom has a word with the men. Recently, a leading independent research organization set out to find what men from coast to coast really want when it comes to good grooming. The handsome grooming that helps bring success socially and on the job. Not just men in one city or town, but 7,578 men in 31 cities all over America were asked, what advantages do you consider most important in a hair tonic? The results show that one hair tonic, Wild Root Cream Oil, gives men exactly what they're looking for. Because Wild Root Cream Oil does all three jobs that hair tonic users voted most important. One, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, never leaves it sticky or greasy. Two, Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness. And three, it removes loose, ugly dandruff. Yes, those are the things that men want a hair tonic to do, and Wild Root Cream Oil does all three. What's more... Wild Root Cream Oil gives you other advantages, which, as our survey shows, men definitely appreciate. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil. And it's the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. And remember, according to a recent nationwide survey, there are three jobs that men want a hair tonic to do. And Wild Root Cream Oil does all three. Now back to our dark venture for tonight. The only inhabitant. During the next few days, while we got ready for the trip to Harala, I learned a little about this strange old duck who lived out here in the middle of nowhere. His name was Henry Gordon. He was an Englishman, but he'd spent the last 30 years here in China. When he said he was going to destroy me, I wanted to laugh in his face. A little runt with only one arm who didn't weigh a hundred pounds. Just the same, I wasn't going to take any chances. And when we started our long hike, I kept them ahead of me all the time. 
And that night when we made camp, you began to understand that he wasn't dealing with any dope. How's the food coming? It's almost ready. How far would you say we traveled today? Oh, perhaps ten kilometers. Kilometers? <laughs> How come you talk so good? I was educated at Cambridge. Why did you become a hermit? Here's your food. Okay, hey, check. Wait a second. Don't go away. Huh? Sit down. You must think I'm a pretty dumb guy. I don't understand. I ain't forgotten you promised to destroy me. Well, one good way would be to poison my food. Well, the food is not poison. Just to make sure you eat from this plate first. But I... Look, when I say something, don't argue with me. You eat from this plate first. All right, if you wish. Yeah, I wish. And here's something else you better know, Pally. In case you figure on waiting until I fall asleep and then beating it, in case you figure that's your way to get me, you can forget about that, too. You see this belt? While we sleep, I'm tying you to me. We're going to be real close, you and I. I see. Yeah. I'm playing it smart, Pally. <laughs> After that, he didn't try nothing. But I started having another worry. Every day we hiked a few miles farther through the wilderness. But even after a week, it didn't seem like we were getting anywhere. Then I started thinking maybe this guy was taking me around in circles. Maybe that's how he figured on destroying me. Hey, Pally. Yes? Stop for a minute. I want to talk to you. Well... How long do you figure we'll have to hike through this wild country to get to Harala? Oh, three months, ten months, who can say? <gasps> oh. From now on, every time you give me one of them phony answers, you're going to get smacked like that. Now, how many days? If we maintain our present rate, we should be within sight of Harala in 90 days. However, I assure you, it won't do you a bit of good now. Still going to destroy me, huh? <laughs> okay, if it makes you happy to think so, it's no skin off my nose. But I want you to know one thing, Pally... Don't try to lead me around in circles. You needn't worry about that. Oh, I ain't worried. Because beginning the day, I'm going to start counting days. And when I reach 90, if we ain't within sight of Harala, guess what's going to happen to you? But I guess the old guy was on the up and up. Because on the 87th day, I stopped counting. There it is. There on the horizon. There's your harala. Yeah, so that's it. It don't look like much. You'll find it's what you want. A hideaway for evil men. <laughs> yeah, good. And uh, what about your threat? Guess you don't make good on it after all, Polly. I'm satisfied. And now that I've taken you this far, I'll go back to my own home. Uh, you look pretty weak. And with that arm of yours... Uh... You think you could make it? I think so. I don't. I don't think you could make it in a million years, Pally. Besides, I can't really let you go back because there's just a chance that someday somebody else may come along and you tell about me. So I'm going to give you a great big break. A what? This. <laughs> who destroyed who, Pally? <laughs> I guess I just about ran the rest of the way to Harala. But it sure wasn't nothing for a picture postcard. A stinking little town with dark wooden houses all crowded together. Oh, I didn't care about that. Let it be a hideout. Nobody'd ever find me in a million years. That's all that mattered. When I got here, it was already night. But I found a bar room quick enough. It was pretty crowded. Not with Chinese, but with white guys. Every one of them probably in the same boat as me. I went in to get a drink and maybe find out where I could get a room. I'll never forget it. Never. Hey, bartender, you savvy American? Sure. Why not? What's your go? Hey! What's the matter? Get out of here. Huh? What are you talking about? Get out of here right away. Get out or I'll kill you. <laughs> I never saw a guy scared like that before. Not even guys I'd knocked off. I got out of there all right. The shock of him acting like that kind of threw me. But after a while, I, I started figuring maybe he was drunk or something. And I started looking for someplace else. 
I found what looked like a little hotel. I went in. The clerk, a Chinese guy, was drowsing at the desk. Come on, wake up. I want a room. Wake up. A room. I want a room. A room? Yeah. Oh! Hey! Get out! 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 Get That's what I ran into when I first came to Harala. And it's been like that ever since. I've been going nuts. What's wrong with this town? Why don't nobody help me? Someone told me to see you, that you're some kind of wise man. Okay, tell me what's wrong, wise man. Tell me what's wrong, or sir. Help me, I'll kill you too. I told you I would explain. And I shall. But after I have explained... My advice is that you take the gun and turn it on yourself. What are you talking about? This town will never shelter you, nor will any other town in all China. But why? Why? Because Henry Gordon was right. He did destroy you. You're crazy. When I got what I wanted out of him, I killed him. You killed him too late. Why do you suppose he was so crippled? Look, look, I don't get it. Why do you suppose everyone in Harala runs away from you when they see your face? What are you talking about? Because on your face, they see the evidence. So you made him sample your food. So you kept him by your side the entire journey. (laughs) How very clever of you. Yes, the weakest man of all destroyed you, my friend. Why do you suppose Henry Gordon was the only inhabitant of that valley? Because he had what he gave you, leprosy. Dark Venture is written by Larry Marcus and directed by Leonard Rieg. Next week at the same time, the Wild Root Company, makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the Hair, will bring you another original story from the Land of the Shadows. And now, Harry Wallstrom warns the men in our audience about smart girls. Men, it's true. A smart girl knows that a man with sloppy-looking hair is likely to be sloppy about other things, too. So, show her how neat you are, how handsome you can look. Groom your hair with non-alcoholic wild root cream oil. As a recent nationwide survey shows, wild root cream oil does all three jobs that men consider most important. It grooms your hair naturally, it relieves annoying dryness, and it removes embarrassing loose dandruff. What's more... Non-alcoholic wild root cream oil contains lanolin, the soothing oil that's so much like the oil of your own skin. No wonder four out of five users from coast to coast preferred wild root cream oil to all other hair tonics they'd tried before. You'll like wild root cream oil, too. So take wild root's FN test. Check your scalp. Dryness or loose dandruff tells you you need wild root cream oil right away. Tonight's dark venture, William Tracy was heard as Eddie. The others in the cast were Alec Harford, Norman Field, Peter Chong, and Jack Moyles. Original music by Dean Postler. Your narrator has been John Lake. William Tracy may soon be seen in the Hal Roach production, Here Comes Trouble. Until next Tuesday, remember... Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick, good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's great for training children's hair.
over the minds of mortal men come many shadows. Shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So in the sudden shadows which fog the minds of men and women are to be found the strange impulses which urge them into the unknown. Dark Venture came to you from Hollywood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Phantoms of a world gone by speak again the immortal tale declared insane. This is the church she comes to. There she is, Renee, kneeling in the pew. Third row from the left. What do you think of your rival for your husband's affections? Are you positive that's the same, Madame Jean Renault? I'd stake my honor upon it. Cecil, you've staked your honor so often there's nothing left to it. Madame. Amazing. I wonder how a woman like that could extract such huge sums of money from my husband. She might have certain charms you don't understand. But she's fat and pockmarked. True, Renee but powerful enough to make you and your children penniless within ten years. How can we break her hold on Pierre? I've tried. Pierre won't listen to me, either as his brother or his lawyer. So there's only one thing left. What's that? Simply that you ask for a commission for lunacy against him. Imply that he's insane and have him locked away. But Pierre is insane With your political as... prestige at Louis XV's court, I'm sure we can convince a young ambitious judge to the contrary. Pierre's many eccentricities can bear fruit. His monomania on Chinese customs could easily be misinterpreted. Do you understand? But, Cecil, I... Now listen to me. Tomorrow morning, I want you to pay an unexpected visit on your husband. Drive out to that country hollow and... Is your master in, Roger? Madame le Marquise, we weren't expecting you. Do come in. Monsieur is in the study. If you follow me, he'll be pleased to see you, Madame. It's been such a long time. Thank you, Roger. Monsieur, Madame le Marquise? Rene. I'm sorry to disturb you, Pierre, but you know what the court says. The separation of ours does not do my reputation any good. Your reputation? Naturally. What are you doing dressed up in that silly outfit? I am writing a history of China, Rene. One can't understand the Chinese mind without trying to feel the tempo of their mode of life. Oh, that's neither here nor there. I've been hearing about the way you're handling the children. The children are well and healthy. I don't feel comfortable about them out here. 
So I'd like to change nurses. The woman you have now is too old for the job. I've brought an English woman out here with me today. Her name is Maggie Campbell. I think you'll find Maggie a gem in many ways. Your absent-mindedness endangers our children's very existence. What are you hinting at? Hinting? You know very well what I mean. That woman, Madame Jean Renault. She's no concern of yours. My son's future inheritance, however, is my concern. I can't prevent you from throwing it away on a swine-headed woman. Oh, Renee, but really? Really what? Who is this Jean Renault? What power has she got over you? Why do you insist on living in the country and giving her the major part of your income? That's one question you'll never have answered. You wouldn't understand. That's why I've hired Maggie Campbell to act as nursemaid. The children are never to be in that woman's company. And Miss Campbell will follow those instructions to the letter. Well, Renee, I didn't expect you to come back so soon. It didn't take me long to sell Pierre on the idea of hiring your fatuous Miss Campbell, Cecil. What did he think of her? Nothing much. My story was completely believable. We can depend on Maggie Campbell to weave an interesting web for Pierre to stumble into. In the meantime, you've work to do. Work? I've invited young Bianchon for a party at your house this evening. Aren't you presumptuous? Not at all. That fool has always been in love with you. His uncle is a judge of the inferior court, Monsieur Popeno. If you can convince Bianchon to bring his uncle into our camp, our commission for lunacy against Popier is one. You're in a position to do both of them a great deal of political good. It might be wise to remind them of it, gently. The party is to start at night. Really good time, really. Bien, Jean. I'm so glad you could come to my little party. Oh, you're playing with my heart, madame. Ah. If only I were a free woman. Free to play with a man's heart. Oh. But my husband being ill... Oh, Pierre's ill? Didn't you know? No. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. It's a mental condition. I thought you knew. Oh, is there anything that I can do? I'm afraid there's nothing anyone can do. He insists now upon throwing his money away on a woman, known as Jean Renault, whom he favors now. Oh, a woman. A fat, ugly, pockmarked woman who is closer to 60 years of age than anything else. He's given her almost a million francs. Oh, this is serious, madame. But what can I do? He controls all the money in the family except my own small income. Well, have you ever thought of securing a commission for lunacy against him? My own husband, Monsieur Bianchon? But it's necessary, madame. My uncle is judge of the inferior courts. He could get it for you quite easily. If you'd consent to visit with him, I'm Bianchon. sure... Bianchon. Yes? Could you persuade your uncle to visit me here in my home? I would repay him for his trouble. A close friend of mine, Philippe Brett, is head of the civil courts. He could do your uncle much good if I suggested it. Oh, but of course, René. I shall pay my uncle Pope and Noah a visit this evening. Would tomorrow night be a convenient night for you? So convenient. And if Monsieur Pope and Noah is interested in verifying my case, he might ask Maggie Campbell, my children's nurse, about Pierre's strange actions. If you have a butler in this loony house, come over here and bottle. <laughs> yes, Maggie. Uh, what is it now, nurse? Listen to them, will you? Her father playing with his sons, a twist in their arms as they scream in agony. Look at them there in the garden. Uh, he's teaching the boys how to wrestle, Maggie. Uh, wrestling's a fine art in China. Uh, wrestling, is it? It's a fine kind of wrestling. I'm trying to pull the boys' arms out by the sockets. <laughs> A laughing and a screaming. A maniac's mind. A maniac, I tell you. Even help us. What will the madmen do next? Thank you, driver. Uncle Popino? Uncle Popino? 
Well, if it isn't my nephew. Well, well, Bianchon, come in. Oh, how can you live in this rat trap? And if this is a rat trap, Bianchon, then you should throw your old uncle a piece of cheese. What brings you down here on the banks on this hot day? Oh, a matter of urgency. A friend of mine is in trouble. Uh, trouble. Life was ever thus. Her husband is stark staring mad. And the poor woman hasn't the faintest notion how to go about getting a commission for lunacy. Mm, who is the lady? Madame la Marquise Despard. Madame de la Marquise? Yes. <laughs> she probably knows more about these things than you do, nephew. Uh, nevertheless, I'll see her when she arrives. She's not well, uncle. You can't expect her to visit you in a place like... like this. Mm. Besides, she's a close friend of Philippe Brett, and he's the head of the civil courts and can do you a lot of good. That crook? Oh, don't be no. Madame Le Marquise had the kindness to invite us to dinner at her house tomorrow night. Bien, Jean, I'm surprised at you. You know very well that I'll be the examining judge on the case, and our courts forbid a judge to d dine in a petitioner's home. It's against the law. Oh, yes, I'd, I'd forgotten. After dinner, then, Uncle? Well, she can see me here. In all fairness to her. She's ill, Uncle. Drop in at her house. Was it a request or a demand from her, Bianchon? Both, I imagine, Uncle. Hmm. Even a judge is afraid not to grant her demands. A woman like that is a powerful factor at court. Then you will drop in and see her? Yes. Tomorrow afternoon at three. But warn her not to serve any food or drink to me at all. Oh, yes, Uncle. She will be well warned. Maggie, what are you doing prowling about the master's bedroom? Oh, I, um, I was looking for a good tonic for the children. The master keeps all the medicines locked up here. While I'm about it, uh, you ought to take the tonic, Roger. You don't look so well lately. Oh, I, I never felt better. Mm, spring's uh, coming, Roger. Everybody should take a tonic. Here, drink this. You'll feel like a new man in a few seconds. I'll fix up a draw for the children. Uh, I can't figure you out, Maggie. One moment you shout, and the next you worry about my health. That's just my why, Roger. Go ahead. Drink it. I'm a nurse. I ought to know what's good. Go ahead. Drink it. Well, if this will make us better friends, Maggie, I, I'll drink it. Oh, tastes like poison. Roger. Roger. The master's calling, Roger. Is he what he wants? Uh, I'm coming, Monsieur Le Marquis. You better come along to the study, Roger. I'm expecting a visitor, and I'd better have the place looking spick and span. Uh, visitor, Monsieur? Madame Jean Lenore will be here soon. Then the business between Madame and I will be over, finally. Ah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm... Monsieur, uh, look at the study. More Chinese books than all of China. I need them. I, I, uh... What's the matter, Roger? I feel so ill, Monsieur Le Marquis. In heaven's name, yeah, I, I better don't sit down know. over here, Roger. I, I don't. I'm. I help. Uh, Roger, uh, Maggie, Maggie. What's the matter, Monsieur? Roger, Roger, old fellow. Roger. He's dead. Dead. His skin is turning black, Monsieur. Black. As if he had drunk. Yes. Just as if he drunk a strong draught of Chinese poison. How do you know the effect? I'm a nurse, sir. Now your madness is no longer innocent. You're a murderer, too. Poisoning a poor, helpless man just because he disagreed with you. What are you talking about, Maggie? Well, you know what I'm talking about, monsieur. You're a murderer. A murderer. I'll get the police for your poisonous all in the middle of the night.
Madame la Marquise, may I present my uncle, judge of the inferior courts, Monsieur Popinel. Good afternoon, Monsieur. How do you do? This is my brother-in-law, the Chevalier d'Espard. Say so. How do you do? How do you do? Won't you be seated, Monsieur Popinel? My uncle will do everything in his power to help you, René. I'm sure he will, Bianchon. Tell me, madame, when you and the Marquis separated originally, how much money were you allowed? Just my original income of 26,000 francs a year. Hmm. You say that the Marquis had given a certain Madame Jean Renault considerable sums of money? Almost a million francs. Hmm. Is there any reason for him to give her money? None. None but an imaginary one dictated to him by his twisted mind. Does Madame Jean Renault live well? Live well? In a mansion? I'm a poor man myself, madame. How much does Madame Jean Renault spend on her house? Oh, the stables alone cost 16,000 francs. Mm, judges are apt to be incredulous. If the uh, stables alone cost 16,000... Then how much for the entire establishment? Between 50 and 60,000 francs. So much? You don't say. Now, how much do you spend for this lovely place? About the same, 50 or 60,000. Renee! Huh? Oh. <laughs> I thought you said your income was only 26,000 francs. You must be badly in debt, obviously. But, monsieur... If you're in debt... The court might not feel justified in allowing you to handle your husband's money. They might think you have a different motive for trying to secure control of your husband's money. Not that I have. A selfish one. Do you serve, madame? Well, I'm sorry, madame la marquise. It's against the law for me to eat and drink at a petitioner's home. I thought you knew. Madame la marquise! Madame la marquise! Oh, Maggie! What are you doing here? I've been trying to get her all day, I have. Monsieur Le Marquis has murdered his butler. What? Poisoned him. I saw it with my own eyes. Oh. The police came. They've got him away in the jail. He's stark, staring, writhing mad he is. Murder now. Well, Monsieur Pocono, is murder a part of a sane man's mind? Such a place for a judge to live. Oh, if I lived here, I'd never make old bones. Monsieur Popineau. Yes? I got your summons to come and see you in your house. Well, here I am. Yes, here you are. But who are you? Madame Jean Renault. Hmm. Kind of a judge of you anyway, living here. Huh? You must be an honest one. Well, what do you want to see me about? I've learned that you've been receiving extraordinary amounts of money from Monsieur Le Marquis d'Espard. Oh. Well, as a matter of fact, I have. Mm, what seducer's art have you oh. been using on Monsieur Le Marquis? Oh, seducer's art? <laughs> Look at me, Monsieur. Fat, ugly, hideous. <laughs> what kind of a vamp would I make? <laughs> well, that's a question I can't answer. But you will have to. Monsieur, I'm sorry, but I am under oath. I can never divulge the reason that Monsieur gives me the money. Madame, if you have any pity for your benefactor, you'll tell me. A commission for lunacy has been taken out against him. Huh? And you're named as having some strange power over him. Oh. Power which is supposed to have driven him mad. Oh, great heavens. I am as good as Monsieur Le Marquis and warn him. He's a saint, that man. A saint, Monsieur. Yes, but he isn't at home. He's in jail. Madame Jean Renault. Monsieur Le Marquis, I'm Judge Popinot of the Inferior Court. You're most welcome to come in and share my prison cell. Are you here to accuse me of murdering a man, too? No, monsieur. But your wife has taken out a commission for lunacy against you. Monsieur, you're joking. I wish I were. Your passion for Chinese customs has led them to believe you live in a dream world. I was commissioned to write a book about China by the most respectable firm in all Paris. Have you a contract from them? In my desk drawer at home. Hmm. Are there any duplicate copies in case your copy is stolen? Certainly. Here's the address of the firm. They have the duplicate. Hmm. The second count is, of course, there's murder. You were accused of murdering your butler just to try out a potency of a new Chinese drug you've discovered. Never toyed with Chinese drugs or poisons. How about this business of giving all your money to Madame Jean Renault? Monsieur, I never thought I'd tell anyone that secret. Your life depends on it. 
Madame Jean Renaud is the descendant of the Jean Renaud family who owned a large estate in Saxony in the 13th century. My ancestors murdered her ancestors and stole that property. What has that to do with you? The entire Despard fortune was founded on that property. I'm trying to pay back a debt. The amount of money which should have been paid to the Jean Renaud when the property was taken over. You're too conscientious, Monsieur le Marquis. I don't want my children to be ashamed of their family as I'm ashamed of mine. They'll always be proud of the Despard name. I don't think we'll have any trouble clearing you of this charge. Tell me this. Is there any place in France where the black Chinese poison can be ordered? One place might have it. It's a small pharmacy called Lincoln. Do they carry that particular mixing drug in our pharmacy, Monsieur Popeno? It's too dangerous. But I did have a special order for it from a Cockney woman named Maggie Campbell just the other day. She had a note authorizing her to buy it. Who was the note from? From the head of the medical research department through the Chevalier Despard. Mm, thank you very much. Clerk. Clerk. Has Monsieur Le Marquis Despard's contract arrived from Paris? Yes, Monsieur Popinot, this morning. Where's Madame Jean Renault? She's waiting for you now, Monsieur Popinot. Just have her sign this legal bill of sale for the Saxon property and ask her to appear in court tomorrow morning. Yes, monsieur. And the clerk. Yes. Send this letter to the Marquise Despard. After this note, I don't think she'll appear to press charges. After all, it... Come along, Rene. We'd better go inside the courtroom. It's almost time for the sessions to start. You go ahead, Cecil. I'd like to see Monsieur Philippe Brett before court starts. See you later, then. Oh, my dear René, uh, you look charming. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Not at all. Here's the letter Monsieur Popeno sent me last night and the affidavits you asked for. Mm -hmm. This letter from Popeno places you in a very ugly position. It threatens the entire civil courts, besides naming the head of the medical association, Monsieur Brett. Yes, I know, René. Leave everything to me. I'll see you in court in a few minutes. Order in the court. The Fifth Court of Inferior Appeals is in session. The first case is a commission for lunacy. The case of Madame de la Marquise Despard against Monsieur la Marquise Monsieur Despard. Monsieur Popin. Yes, Monsieur Brett. As head of the civil courts, I cannot allow you to preside on the bench during this case. Cannot allow me? Do you realize, man, you violated the most important law in all France? I have three sworn affidavits that you partook of tea and cake at the household of René Despard at 5 p.m. four days ago. Now, since Madame is the plaintiff in this case, that renders any decision you might give is invalid. But, Monsieur Brett, they are lying. Your own nephew swears it's the truth. Will you relinquish the bench? Who is to take over in my place? Monsieur Devreux. Devreux? Yes. A man who spends his time currying favor for my majesties? Monsieur, will you give up the bench? I have no option. But if I can't work as judge on this case, I will represent Monsieur de la Marquis Despard as his barrister. Will you ascend the bench, Monsieur Duvreux? Naturally, Monsieur, but the barrister in charge of proceedings will start. That is you, Chevalier Despard. Is it not, Cecil? Yes, thank you, Monsieur Duvreux. In behalf of my client, Madame la Marquise, a poor innocent woman who has been robbed of her children, her income and her home, by a lunatic husband who is guilty of murder. You only presume he's guilty of murder. I presume nothing, Bobineau. He has already been tried and convicted. When? Ten minutes before court started. I signed the papers, Monsieur Bobineau. You did, Brad? Yes. You haven't the foggiest notion of what this case concerns. I have definite proof that Maggie Campbell was hired to murder the butler. Here it is. My proof that Monsieur Le Marquis is innocent. Judge Tavro, you can set aside this conviction. Chevalier, let us proceed. A woman named Madame Jarrineau has forced Monsieur Le Marquis to give her over a million francs. We all know that Monsieur Pobineau made up that story about the Saxon property... To fool the court. But these are lies, Monsieur Devro. Continue, Chevalier. And last but not least, we base our claim on the fact that Monsieur le Marquis 
thinks he lives in China. Ha! Is that a thought for a sane man? Monsieur Le Marquis is writing a book on China. He has a contract for that book. We investigated the contract, Monsieur Popeno. The Paris firm swears they never drew it up. Hmm. You've done well, gentlemen, to make a mockery of the courts of France. This trial is a farce, a framed farce. Of course, if you grant the commission for lunacy, you will be heaped with honors by these weakling fools. That is only your opinion, Popeno. Judge Devro, remember, your conscience will weigh heavily on your soul. If you send this man away, you will have only yourself to answer to you wake up in the middle of the night screaming for forgiveness to your maker. Think on it carefully, Judge Devereaux. Think before you make the decision. There is no need for thought. I demand an immediate decision. There's only one decision I can possibly make. An honest one. A decision dictated to me by my conscience and the evidence on hand. The commission for lunacy is granted. Mr. Devereaux. I'm as sane as you are. You can't lock me up. Pope, now tell them. In heaven's name, stop them. Don't let them. God! Take that man out of court and put him in a straitjacket before he loses his mind completely. time-worn pages of the past, we have heard the story declared insane. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you the amazing story of House of Greed. A taxi cab rolls through the night and comes to a stop before a brownstone mansion on West 52nd Street. The driver opens the door, and a handsome, well-dressed man steps out, pays the driver, slips quickly up the stairs, fumbles with a bunch of keys, 
but the door opens. Oh, hello, Jackson. Mr. Talbot, welcome home, sir. Where's Mrs. Talbot? Oh, uh, she left three days ago. Uh, went to the place in the Catskills. There's a note on your desk, sir. Oh, good. Your brother, Frank, is waiting in the library. Oh. Hello, Frank. What do you want? John. Now, look, Frank, I told you the last time I'd give you no more money. Oh, but it isn't gambling debts this time. I'm reforming. I'm going to settle down and work. Hmm. Work? Hmm. I met a big cattleman from South America. He has a very lovely daughter. And she talked her father into letting me buy an interest in the business. How much? Ten thousand. Oh, I'm sure I'll make good, John. Oh, very well. I don't mind doing something like that for you. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. I've had a plane reservation for four days. Mm Mm-hmm. Thanks for the check, John. You're a swell guy. Uh, Tell Mary goodbye for me. Yeah, she's up in the Catskills. So Jackson told me. Good Lord. What's wrong? She hasn't gone to the Catskills. I I can't understand this. What on earth does she mean? Well, what is it? Read it. John, this life is too lonely. I can't go on like this, so I'm leaving you. I found someone else who is more considerate of me. But I... First, I'm going home, and from there, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, but things just didn't work out for us. Mary. Someone who's more considerate of her. Why, I've given Mary everything her heart desired. She must be out of her mind. Uh, Of course, you have been gone a lot, and women get crazy ideas. It's knocked the pins right out from under me. Yes, I can see that. You better take it easy for a while. Yes, I feel, I don't know, kind of sick. All of a sudden, nothing seems to matter. Oh, maybe she'll wake up before she gets too far. Perhaps I'd better cancel my trip for a few weeks until you get straightened out. No, 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 never mind. I'll, I'll pull myself together. I wouldn't have you sidetrack your plans for the world. I think you'd better go now, Frank. I'd rather be alone. All right. But uh, don't do anything foolish. What do you mean? Well, if you brood about it, you're liable to get some crazy ideas and end up really holding the sack. Good luck, Frank. Lots of luck. Thanks. Goodbye, John. John sits for the remainder of the night staring over the top of his desk. The next morning, he closes the house and starts on Mary's trail, which takes him to London, Paris, Berlin, all over Europe but to no avail. Finally, he drops his active interest in his business and goes to live in his country estate. Then one day, 14 years later, he finds himself on a honeymoon. He has married a widow named Helga. Well, John, dear, we got away without too much trouble. Well, it does seem a bit silly, rice and honeymoons at our age. Our age? Well, you sound as though we're a couple of old grannies. I'm 36 and you're 45, and I certainly don't feel old. Why, of course you're not, Helga. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. John, now that the wedding's over, there's something I haven't told you. Oh, I, now I... I well, I, I, I haven't said anything because I was afraid it, it might make a difference. Well, I know what it is. You have a son. How did you know? <laughs> I wondered when you were going to mention it. Oh, well, he finishes school this year. It's been quite a struggle putting him through college. But he's very bright. Paul has studied hard and managed to cram two years into one. Could he spend the summer with us? Why, of course. Oh, John, you're a darling. I should be able to find a place for him in the business. Oh, ask him to come down to our place in the country. Oh, thanks, John. You're wonderful. (laughs) So Helga's son, Paul, came to spend the summer at the country place... And he stayed the next winter and the following summer and the next winter. Now it is summer again. And Paul is still visiting his mother and stepfather. The first year he worked in the office every day until noon. And found business very boring. So finally he quit going to the city at all. But mother, I've looked the whole thing over and there's nothing there that interests me. Well, you can learn about the business. You seem to be able to learn anything else you want to. But I don't care for business. Oh, you're a fool. I worked my knuckles to the bone to give you an education. I married John Talbot to give you a chance, a chance to do something. John has no children. It's a huge business. And one day you could control the whole thing. I'm disappointed in you, Paul. You're letting me down. Well, it seems to run very well without too much attention from him. 
If we were to uh, inherit it, why wouldn't it continue to run just as well? You either get down to that office or you pack your things and get out. Why should I? I'm perfectly satisfied. I'll tell John to make you go. And suppose I tell him what you just said? That you married him just to give me a chance? Married him for his money? You wouldn't dare. And uh, suppose I tell him that you were never divorced from father? That he's still down in South America... Still wandering around trying to find a gold mine. If you dare open your mouth, I'll... Oh, hello there. How are you, Helga? What's this I heard about South America? Oh, why, why, nothing, darling. Paul was just talking about someone he met from down there. Who do you know from South America, Paul? Oh, uh, oh, fellow, I met him today. Were you in the city today? Uh, no, uh, I was down in the village. I didn't suppose you'd been out of the house today. What's his name? Why, uh, I don't remember. I didn't think you would. You haven't been out of this house for three days. Paul, I think you're the laziest man I've ever met. All right, all right. I'll start back to the office Monday. If that's what you and Mother want me to do, I'll do it. Why, I'm sorry I wasn't here for dinner, Helga. I was detained in town. I have quite a bit of work to do. I'll be here in the library for two or three hours. Very well, John. I, I won't bother you. I'll go on upstairs. Besides, I want to have a little talk with Paul. Good night, dear. Good night, Helga. <clears throat> what on earth? Who's out there? Why? What do you want out there? May I come in? I want to talk with you. Well, why do you come to the library windows? Why didn't you ring the bell? I, I didn't want to cause a disturbance. Disturbance? What do you mean? May I come in? Yes, yes, come ahead. Don't you know me, John? Good Lord. Mary. I'm sorry, John. I had to talk with you. I saw the light in the library. What do you want? I... I need your help. Where have you been all these years? Oh, every place. Are you still filled with resentment? It's been too long ago. At first I was. I followed you all over Europe, but never quite caught up with you. No, I'm glad I didn't. There's no telling what I might have done. I'm sorry, John. I was a fool. And I know that now. <coughs> <coughs> May I sit down? Why, of course. <coughs> have you a cold? Yes, I can't seem to shake it. I've had it for weeks. You see, I, I hate to mention it, but you look a bit shabby, Mary. Aren't you doing well? Oh, well, yes. Yes, I'm doing all right. How are you? You've uh, married again. Yes. And your wife is here? Yes. Then I'll be as brief as possible. I, I wouldn't want her to know that I was here. You want me to help your husband? No, not that. I have no husband. What about the man you said was more considerate of you? He left me four years after the baby was born. Baby? You have a child. Yes, John. She's 17 now. And where's the man? I don't know, and I don't care. Oh, John, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I should have known better. But he practically carried me off my feet. And I learned later, to my sorrow, that he was not worth shooting. Where's your daughter? She's in a school in Vermont. I've worked hard to give her an education. I've done everything I could do to give her a chance. I've not seen her very often. But now, well, I... I'm sort of cracking up. I've been ill a lot, and I seem to have trouble getting a job. Job? What kind of a job? Why, any kind of a job. What have you been working at, Mary? Oh, John. I made such a miserable mess of it. I was never able to face things. I always took the line of least resistance. What a shame. And now I've come to the end of my rope. Joan has finished school. She's a lovely girl, John. I can't let her know. I can't take her with me. Why not? She deserves so much more. She deserves a chance in life. I want you to do something for her. Well, why should I? Because she's your daughter, John. Yeah. My daughter? Yes, yours and mine. She was born seven months after I left. Here's the birth certificate. Please, John, do something for her. She shouldn't be made to suffer for my mistake. She's innocent. Well, does she know I'm her father? 
No. And she doesn't remember the other men. Here, I'll give you her address. Fernwood College. And, and I'll write a letter to her explaining all about you. Well, I, I... Oh, John, you could do so much for her. She's a young lady now. And so lovely. Please see her. I know you'll fall in love with her. All right, Mary. I'll, I'll see her. I'll have her come down here. Oh, John. John, I'm so sorry. So sorry for everything I've done. Please forgive me. I've forgotten everything, Mary. Oh, wait a moment. Take this check and do something about that cough. No, thanks, John. I won't need it. You'd better take it. Thanks. I'll be all right in a few days. The cough will be gone. Good night, John. Good night, Mary. If he brings this girl here, do you realize what it means, Mother? Yes. It's his own daughter. If he falls for her, if he, if he likes her, he'll change his will and split the estate. She's entitled to it, isn't she? Now, why should she be? Strange girl he didn't even know existed. Popped up out of nowhere and cheats us out of half the estate. I know what you mean. We've been here for several years. You're his wife. It isn't fair. What would you do about it, Paul? I'd see that she didn't get anything. How would that be possible? Suppose she, uh, she didn't like it here. Supposing that before John got attached to her, the things happened that would make her dislike everything here. If she runs away soon enough, he won't change his will. Perhaps you're right. And if she doesn't? Then maybe something could happen to John. Later, something could happen to the girl. But in any event, the will must not be changed. Where do you get such ideas? <laughs> That, Joan, dear, is the story of your mother. I trailed them all over Europe, but never quite caught up with them. You mean you planned to kill them? Kill them? I was filled with revenge, but I finally gave up the chase and returned here to wait. I knew that sooner or later she'd show up. But it's been so long ago. Surely you've lost the desire for revenge by this time. Time heals many wounds, my dear. If you had caught up with them and satisfied your revenge, what good would it have done? Quite right, my dear, quite right. Tell me... Have you no recollection of this man? You can recall nothing about him? Absolutely nothing. Remember, I was only four when he went away. And you do believe that I'm your father? What else am I to believe? Mother proved that with the birth certificate. Proved that I'm Joan Talbot, not Joan Evans, as I've always believed. Of course. And would you like to remain here? Why, yes, I, I think I would, well, but There I... seems to be a doubt. Why do you hesitate? I don't know. From all the evidence, I belong here. I have a legal right, but... Well, I can't seem to find words to express it. Express what? From the moment I stepped in the door of this house, I've had a, a strange feeling. A cold, chilly sensation of, of fear. Well, is it something you feel about me? Yes. You're afraid of me? No, I, I don't think so. Is it Helga? Well... Is it Paul? Oh, please, please don't ask me anymore. I don't know what it is. Well, what has Paul said to you? Nothing. No one said anything. It, it's just a premonition of... of evil. There's something wrong. Something horribly wrong in this house. Oh, you're imagining things, Joan. It's all in your mind. It will pass as suddenly as it came. You're young, Joan, impressionable, and you suddenly found your life turned upside down. A new environment to which you've never become accustomed, but you'll get used to it. You're my daughter. I want you to have what you deserve, what is rightfully yours. I understand. And I'll try to overcome this feeling. Yeah, that's better. You're a lovely girl, Joan. An intelligent girl. I know I'm going to be very proud of you. Thank you. I think I'll go to bed now. Well, it is rather late. Good night, dear. See you in the morning. Hello. Paul, what are you doing here on the stairs in the dark? I wanted to tell you something. What? You're very, very beautiful. Your eyes, your hair, just like gold. Gold moonbeams. And soft. Paul! 
in your throat. Your throat is slender and soft. Like... Take your hands off my neck. Paul! I don't know many girls. Girls don't like me. Let me by. You don't like me either, do you? Well, I... I know. I can tell. Elsie didn't like me either. She was afraid of me. Who's Elsie? She was a girl in the village. She worked here in the summertime. No one knows what became of her. What? I don't remember what happened to her. But her throat was slender and white like yours. Let me by! What? Who's here? Who's in this room? Don't turn on the light. Helga. What do you want? I must talk to you. What about? You're not safe here. No one is safe in this house. You must leave at once. What do you mean? What's wrong? The house is wrong. It's filled with evil and hate. I know. Why do you stay? I can't leave. It's too late. But you must go at once. Do you mean that Paul... That's part of it. And what else? John. John? What about him? I can't tell you. But you must believe me. What about my father? He doesn't believe he is your father. And he's planning to get revenge on your mother through you. I don't believe you. I won't. Get away while you have a chance. No. I won't run from it. I'll face it, whatever it is. Very well. Good night, Joan. It is nearly midnight. John still works at his desk in the library. But outside, a man steps softly through the trees upon the terrace, quietly opens the library doors, and steps in. Hello, John. Frank. Good Lord. Yes, Brother Frank. <laughs> well, why don't you say something? Come in, or get out, or something? Why, why, come in, Frank, you... Fairly knocked me off my feet. I didn't know whether you were alive or dead. It's been a long time, John. Why haven't you written me? Well, I was hoping I could make a go of that ranch and pay you back, but... Uh, I guess I was just born unlucky. Oh. They had a revolution and cleaned Senor Gonzalez out and me with him. That's too bad, Frank. But you're still the same steady, reliable John. Yes, sir, I've tried my darndest to be like you, but... Well, it just isn't in me. I don't have what it takes. The last two years, I've had a pretty tough time. I caught some sort of a malarial fever down there, and it's impossible to get rid of it. it keeps recurring. You certainly don't look well. You've aged quite a bit. You better have Dr. Richards look you over tomorrow. Oh, she's still kicking around. I thought he'd be gone long ago. How's your new marriage turned out? Oh, very well. Very well indeed. Good. Ever hear from Mary? Yes. She came to see me. I knew she would eventually. She was broken quite ill. She'd had a tough time of it. And you helped her out. <laughs> you would. You couldn't turn anyone down. Well, she was mainly interested in my helping the girl. She had her in a school in Vermont. And so now you're taking care of both of them. What else could I do? Good old Joe. I sent for the girl and brought her down here. She's a lovely child. Sweet as can be. And you'll give her everything her heart desires, I suppose. And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joan. A girl 17 either wants to get married or go to college. Oh? Well, I've decided that. <laughs> really? I'd like to send her to Wellesley. Good. is isn't every man who can Just have... Just a minute, Frank. I'll be right back. Well, what are you doing out here in the hall this time of night for? Oh, well, uh, uh, Mother sent me down to see why you hadn't come up to your room. Oh, well, tell her I'll be up in a few minutes. Yes, uh, yes, I'll tell her. My stepson, Paul. His mother thought I was staying up unusually late. Oh, well, I'll run along. Good heavens, it's after 12. Now, when's the last train back to the city? 12 o'clock. You've missed it. Well, when's the next one? 5 a.m. Oh. Well, I, I suppose I'll have to wait for that. Can you put me up? 
Yes, of course, Frank. Oh, thanks. Well, wait a moment, Frank. I probably won't be up when you leave, so I'll give you this now. Oh, now, John, I uh, I didn't come here for that. Hmm? I... Well, that is not exactly. <laughs> no, you never have. Here you are, Frank. A thousand. And see Doc Richards first thing in the morning. And drop in at the office and let me know what he says. Thanks, John. I, I'm i sorry that I have to take this. I, I only wish that... Oh, forget it. We're not kids any longer. You're too old to learn new tricks now. Run along to bed, Frank. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, uh, take the guest room at the head of the stairs. Good night, John. See you in town at noon. Night, Frank. The clock strikes three as two figures slip down the darkened hall and quietly enter John's bedroom. Then a few minutes later, the same two figures make their way in the moonlight through the trees to the back of the estate carrying a long, gruesome bundle wrapped in a sheet. Now it is three nights later, and Joan, Helga, and Paul are in the library as Joan paces back and forth anxiously. But where could Father have gone? He didn't say a word about going out of town. Well, maybe he doesn't want to come back. Why not? Uh, I don't know. Maybe he doesn't like it here. You should have listened to me. But you didn't say anything about... Well, well, you just mentioned me. Could it be a mistake? I just had a weird feeling of impending disaster. Something is wrong, I know. If I didn't belong here, if I could leave, I'd not stay another moment. Who knows what will happen next? I know. What do you know? I know what will happen next. They always happen in twos. Many people have come here, stayed a while, and then suddenly disappeared. What time is it? 11.30. There's a train at 12. I'm leaving here. Hello? Yes, this is Joan Talbot. What? Good heavens, who? Where? Yes. Yes, I understand. Yes, I... I'll be here. Yes. Who was it? I, I don't know. I've never heard anything like it. What do you mean? It, it was a man and he... What man? He said he had a message for us. And he'll be here at 12 o'clock and... to wait for him in the library. The police? I don't know. He said he'll come to the garden windows, to the library window. Who could it be? I don't know. But we'll wait. I'm going to see this through. Here he comes. Through the garden. Who... Who is it, Mother? I, I don't know. The lights... Why did you turn out the lights? I turned them out so we could see outside. Who is he? I don't know. He, he, he's up on the terrace. Who, who are you? What do you want? I came to talk to you. What about? About what happened here at three o'clock in the morning several days ago. Nothing happened. Nothing. But something did happen. Turn on the lights. No, don't turn them on. You couldn't see me if you turned on the lights. Paul, good Lord. Was it you who phoned me? I spoke to you, but I didn't phone you. Mother. What happened in this house at three o'clock several days ago? A man was murdered. What? Paul. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Joan Talbot, open the top drawer of that desk. Now take out the paper. It says, on the night of August 5th, we, the undersigned, murdered John Talbot in his bedroom, and buried his body on the estate. We didn't. We didn't. It's John. It's John. Sign it. Sign the paper and I'll go. Sign it, Paul. Sign it. You did it. You killed him. Sign it. You help me. You sign it. I can't. I can't. Turn on the lights, Joan. John. It's, it's him. It's him. He isn't dead. No, Paul. No, we didn't. Paul, what happened? I'll tell you. You killed my brother Frank instead. 
Come on in, Sergeant. You heard it all. Yes, we heard it all. Father, what on earth happened? When you phoned a while ago, I almost fainted. I was sure you were dead. I knew from the moment you told me you were frightened in this house that something was wrong. I put two and two together and realized what it was. They didn't want you to share on the estate. I knew they were planning something on that night. And then my brother came. He accidentally got into my room by mistake. And they killed him instead of me. I saw them carrying his body through the trees. So I disappeared for a few days and evolved this plan. You've nothing to worry about any longer, Joan. Nothing. No. <laughs> nothing to worry about. But the truth would certainly amaze you. All that Helga said about Paul and John was true. John was planning revenge, but not through Joan. That night your brother Frank came back. You discovered something, John. What was it Frank said? And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joan. A girl 17 either wants to get married or go to college. It was then, John, that you knew the truth. The only way that Frank could have possibly known that the girl's name was Joan and that she was 17 was to have been with Mary. So John knew then that it was Frank who ran away with Mary and deserted her when Joan was four years old. And then, John, knowing that Helga and Paul planned to kill him, deliberately let Frank occupy his room on that fateful night. John's revenge was satisfied, and he didn't have to turn a hand. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. And now an important announcement regarding a change of time. Beginning one week from tomorrow night, on Sunday, September 13th, The Whistler will come to you at 9.15 p.m. Remember, Sunday, September 13th, at 9.15 p.m. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Strange Wills. Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Perry Ward, Lorene Tuttle, and an all star Hollywood cast with the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins. Envy, pride, hate, jealousy, despair, greed, and anger. And here is Warren William. These are the stories of strange wills made under the strangest of circumstances, and very often by exceedingly strange people. Human emotions run rampant through the pages of their last written declarations, as though knowing that the Grim Reaper is waiting patiently at their sides. They, in a final outburst, fling the challenge of death into the face of uncertain destiny. You'll see what I mean a little later, but first, a few words from your announcer.
And now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in The Lady and the Pirate. It has been my good fortune to come from an illustrious line of lawyers. My inherited legal birthright dates back to the year 1724, when my ancestor and namesake, John Francis O'Connell, left England under the king's command to become the legal counselor to the governor of the Carolinas. But he had another mission, a secret one. He was sent to the Carolinas to personally direct in the capture and hanging of the notorious pirate and renegade Englishman, Black Richard Templeton, whose ship, the Elizabeth, cast a shadow of death and doom across the trade lanes in Caribbean waters. How Black Richard finally died is of no relative importance, but his will, written under the most peculiar of circumstances, remains as one of the most unique ever to be filed in probate. Let us now turn back the pages of history to a May evening in the year 1724. His gracious majesty's ship, the Royal Vengeance, bound for the Carolinas and the New World, is moving slowly down the channel toward the open sea. Only three passengers are aboard. The charming and beautiful Lady Ruth Carroll, whose husband died while fighting in his majesty's service against France. Her personal maid, Cecile, and I... John Francis O'Connell, barrister and personal representative of the king. The lady Carol and her maid are leaning against the rail as they watch the slow progress of the ship as it passes the shadowy docks and buildings that line the waterfront. Weeks and months ahead lies the new world. Uncertainty, adventure, but we Britishers are an adventurous race. Cecile, we're off at last on our great adventure. I wonder, my lady, if we'll ever see our beloved England again. I hope that divine providence will help us reach your uncle's plantation safely. Divine providence in our fearless ship, Cecile. Are you still afraid, little chipmunk? Haven't I told you the royal vengeance crowds more sail, carries more guns, and is manned by the bravest crew in all England? Yes, my lady Ruth, but... But But what, Cecile? I know all that to be true, but I worry nonetheless... I've heard tales, tales from seafaring men. I've heard them tell of... Oh, oh but I shouldn't frighten you, me lady. Oh, frighten me. <laughs> Goodness, Cecile, nothing ever frightens me. Go on. I've heard them tell of, of well, uh, about that pirate, Black Richard, they call him. And if their stories are true, his deeds are blacker than his name. He sounds exciting, Cecile. Oh, how I would love to cross the path of this Black Richard. Me lady. I mean every word I say. I'm not afraid of any man. To show this lout up in his stupidity would be my greatest delight. Ah, but if he sees you, if Black Richard should ever see you... (laughs) Well, let him. He'll see how high an English girl can toss her chin. He'll see that I'm no scullery maid to be trifled with. Oh, me lady, I'm afraid he'll see more than that. What do you mean? He'll see two red lips bursting with ripeness. He'll see blue eyes as soft as a summer cloud <laughs> and a figure that was the toast of London. And seeing, what do you think he will do, Cecile? I'd rather not say, my lady. A good ship, the Royal Vengeance, sailed on toward the New World. The weather was brisk. The wind filled every ounce of sail she carried. In less than six weeks, she'd put in at the Canaries for supplies and then sailed on. Would the crossing be made without misadventure, without sighting Black Richard? It was inevitable that Lady Ruth Carroll and I should become good friends. It was inevitable, too, that we should discuss what was on everyone's tongue and mind, Black Richard. Late one evening at dinner. (laughs) If what you say of Miss True, Mr. O'Connell... You've good reason to be practicing with the cutlass. My heavens, he'll make a swordsman of you yet. <laughs> and that he has, my lady. Most of my waking hours have been devoted to the deadly art of the cutlass. And I must confess, <laughs> I've even practiced in my sleep. <laughs> Just let me see Black Richard, and I promise you, my lady, he'll be carrying fit for the buzzer. In spite of all your <laughs> horrible stories about making the men walk the plank and taking the women to his lonely isle near Nassau... I'm still not the least bit afraid. (laughs) Brave girl. And you've really no reason to be. The Royal Vengeance carries 60 guns, and each gun crew has been trained by the Royal Navy. Our gallant Captain Hughes is considered the bravest, most fearless master on the high seas. 
No, this Black Richard won't tackle us this crossing. Oh, fiddlesticks, I'm disappointed. No, don't be, my lady. Consider yourself fortunate. As our ship drew near the Bahamas, the first ill omen appeared. The barometer fell rapidly. The Royal Vengeance was running head on into a storm, and the wind, reaching hurricane velocity, was driving us nearer and nearer to the lair of Black Richard. Captain Hughes was prepared for the storm. Up the main top, Master! Hurry! Keep your eyes open for strange ships! Aye, aye, sir! Batten down the hatches! Gun crews on the alert! We can't be caught napping! Mr. O'Connell! Mr. O'Connell! Aye, Captain! You'll take the ladies below for their personal safety and yours. We're going to have dirty weather. My lady, Cecile, you heard we're ordered below. Oh, isn't this storm wonderful? Look at the waves. Oh, sheer mountains. And the wind, how it howls. Like the very devil, if you ask me. Just think, Mr. O'Connor. Somewhere out there in the same storm is Black Richard. I wonder what he's doing. More than likely heading straight for port. I doubt if he enjoys this any more than we do. I heard a sailor say that this is Black Richard's weather. That when the storm is at its worst, he ties himself to the topmast with his spyglass and he looks for ships. And then he follows them in the storm. That's utter and... nonsense. No man in his right mind. We'd better go below before the captain puts us in chains. Well, at least in the cabin we won't be able to hear the wind. Hold on the rope, Cecile, and you too, my lady. Or you'll likely be blown right off the ship. That's right. Easy now. There we are. Now down the steps. Rest if you can, Lady Ruth. I'll go on deck. If anything unusual happens, rest assured, I'll come back and tell you. The only thing unusual that's going to happen is that I'm getting a funny feeling in my stomach. Oh, why did I ever leave England? I'll never know. I'll never know. Oh, forgive me, my lady. Mr. O'Connell, but... I think I'm going to die. All that night the storm raged on in unabated fury. The passengers and crew, with few exceptions, became violently ill. Sleep was out of the question. It became a matter of personal survival against the elements. With the first leaden signs of dawn, the wind abated. I staggered out of my cabin and walked up to the deck. Just as I reached it, I heard a cry from the direction of the topmast. Sail! The sail to starboard! Man the guns! Clear the deck! Describe the ship! I can't see her clear, sir. The sea is too heavy. She looks like a frigate. She carries about 40 guns and she's flying... She's flying the Union Jack! Lieutenant! Send a shot across the bow! Hell will stop her until we can send over a boarding party to examine her papers. She's coming on under full sail. Who is she? She's lowering her flag. It's coming down. It... She's sending up another. I can't... Wait. Yes. Yes, it's the Jolly Roger. The skull and the crossbones. She's a pirate ship, the Elizabeth. The pirate ship, the Elizabeth. <laughs> On board, things were in bad shape. The men weakened from the storm were in no condition to repel a serious attack. On and on came Black Richard's ship, and then, when we were in cannon range... All hands on deck to repel the attack! Stand by for action! Chop away the broken mast and clear the debris! Gun crews, break her fore and aft! Be alive there! Mr. O'Connell, you'll go below and assist Lady Carroll and her mate to escape should we found her to be taken. But, Captain... That's an order, Mr. O'Connell. Aye, sir. And God save the Royal Vengeance. Yes, Mr. O'Connell. God save the Royal Vengeance. Even as I went below deck with Lady Ruth and Cecile, I was formulating a plan of action. I had been sent to the Carolinas under the king's command to assist in the capture and hanging of Black Richard the pirate, and I would do just that no matter what the captain ordered. But first, I must allow for the safety of Lady Ruth and Cecile. 
Come, come, come. Lady Ruth, listen. I hear the sound of cutlasses. The pirates have boarded the ship. Mr. O'Connell, I'm afraid. Mr. O'Connell, I'm so afraid. Sir, uh, quiet, Cecilia. Now listen carefully, both of you. I want you to do exactly as I say, or your life may be forfeited. Lady Ruth, get into a serving gown immediately. But... Uh, but... There's no time for but. If you are taken prisoner, tell them that you are both scullery maids, sailing in bondage to the colonies. All of your fineries, everything, must be cast into the sea. Not a trace. Oh, I knew I never should have left London. Just think Black Richard will capture us and carry us off to his island. We'll all be slaves to those filthy pirates. I'm going back on deck to engage Black Richard. I'll try to come back if matters worsen, but heed me. If you hear the sound of battle turning against us, you are to jump out of your window into the sea. That's an order. Tell the great barrister would have us cast ourselves into the sea. Death before dishonor and all that belly rot. I say, get me a cutlass. I'll fight You'll these. do as you, as I say, young lady. But I can't swim. I can't. Quiet, both of you. As you can see, the water is covered with the debris from the battle. If necessary, hang on to anything within reach. And trust to God's providence. <laughs> on deck, matters were serious. The pirates, led by that merciless creature, Black Richard, were driving the king's men backward steadily. I looked for Black Richard, but in the heat of the battle, I could not find him. However, I soon found myself engaged in a furious combat with one of his cutthroats. Hell, blow me down if I ain't found me a dandy. <laughs> Lace, frills, and silver buckles. <laughs> there for all the frills. You found a man who will soon carve the heart out of your, your worthless carcass. <laughs> Listen to them pretty words. Why, you fancy pants, I'll slice your gizzard to ribbons. To that, I take oath. There, there, you friggin'. Taste the king's seal. Rally, men! Rally round the king's standard! Part two of Strange Wills follows in just a moment. Now, back to The Lady and the Pirate and Warren William. The battle raged on. I saw our gallant captain fall, slashed by a dozen cutlasses. And then, through the melee, I saw the man I'd sworn to capture and hang. There he was, Black Richard, brandishing his heavy cutlass now red with blood. I challenged him. Black Richard Templeton, surrender in the name of the king. You ask Black Richard to surrender? Ha, 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 look around you, lads. You have not a handful left alive. As long as I'm alive, I intend to run you through. Why, you young pipsqueak, I'll slice the ears off your curly black head. That I promise by the beard of Beelzebub. <laughs> your faith is not so haughty now, Black Richard. Your eyes are blinded by your foul blood. Uh, I got him. I got him, Black Richard. Crashed him right into the sea with a belaying pin I did. Ah. Oh. oh, Captain, your face is based in a bit. Here, Captain, sit down when I finish off the rest of this high-born scum. It'll only take a blooming minute. 
My unexpected fall into the water revived me almost immediately. Looking up at the ship, I saw that I had fallen close alongside Lady Ruth's cabin. Cecile was at the window, looking frantically down at me. Hurry, Mr. O'Connell, hurry. The pirates have come below. Go first, Cecile. Hurry, Chipmunk. I'll get my jewels. Open up in there. Open up or I'll carve the heart out of your body. Here I come, Mr. O'Connell. All right, Cecile, quickly now. Ruth! Ruth, where are you? Hurry! Hurry! <laughs> well, shiver my timbers. Look what I captured. Cecile and I, clinging to our spar, watched the Royal Vengeance break out in angry flames and then, like a tired warrior, slowly sink into a foaming sea. In the far distance, we could see the pirate ship Elizabeth settle slowly by the bow. It had been a death struggle. But fate was kind. The very next morning, a British man of war sighted us adrift and saved our lives. Eventually, Cecile and I reached the Carolinas. But the weeks passed, and nothing more was heard about the gallant crew and the royal vengeance, or from Lady Ruth. Strangely, too, nothing more was heard from Black Richard. He had disappeared just as mysteriously as the rest. What had happened? I was sitting in my chambers one afternoon, almost two years later. There's a lady to see you, sir. She says you will recollect. Her name is Carol. A Lady Ruth Carol. What? Lady Ruth Carol? Oh, I can't believe it. You. You, Lady Ruth. I... Your obedient servant, sir. May I enter? Oh, by all means. But you must be a ghost. I simply can't believe that you're alive. Here, here, sit down. Thank you. I had great adventure, Mr. O'Connell. I've lived and I've learned. I'm not the same girl you once knew. That night, Lady Ruth and I had a quiet supper. I didn't want to seem impatient, but inwardly I was seething with unanswered questions. And then... I know you want to hear about the rest of the story, Mr. O'Connell. As you know, the door of my cabin was broken down just as Cecile escaped through the window. As the door crashed, I turned and looked at my... my captor. He grabbed me around the waist and carried me on deck to where the pirate captain, Black Richard, was lying, with his head and eyes swathed in a bloody bandage. I stood alongside Black Richard and I looked down at him. As soon as he spoke, I knew he was no ordinary pirate. I'm sorry I can't receive you more appropriately, lass... But as you see, I... I see that you are sorely wounded, sire. Who are you, lass? I am a scullery maid in bondage to the colonies. A scullery maid? <laughs> you think me a fool? You do not believe me? Once, long, long ago, I knew ladies such as you. You are highborn. Who are you? Come, come, out with it. I'm only an English girl, proud of her heritage and her race. Well said. Well spoken. That is my misfortune. I can't see you. Not for the present, at least. And please don't try. I'm nothing much, I assure you. Come now, I will change your bandages, and then we must leave this ship. Your cannon have set it afire. Morris! Morris, the fast Hi, Captain. I be here. Are all off? All, all off, sir. All but us three. I have the boat waiting. But hurry, Captain. The fighter is gaining. Now then, lass, we'll attend to my hurts. If you will pardon the use of my petticoats for bandages. <laughs> No man was ever luckier. First now, I'll take the bandage from your eyes. Here it comes. Why the gasp? Does the sight of blood frighten you? Oh, no. Oh, no, it isn't that. It... It is an ugly wound, I know. Not one for fair eyes like yours. It's not the wound, my... Sire, forgive me. You must be in pain. The pains of the flesh are small. Much worse... I know that my fighting days are over. I know that... that I am blind. Is it not true, lass? Yes, sire, it is true. You are blind. The three of us set out in the small boat. By that time, the Elizabeth had sunk beneath the waves. During the night, we suffered our first casualty. Morris, the pirate who accompanied us, was washed into the sea. Finally, after I'd given up all hope, I sighted land. It turned out to be a small, uninhabited island. Our landing through the heavy surf was miraculous. 
Black Richard was greatly weakened through the loss of blood. I half carried, half dragged him up to the beach. He spoke to me weakly. So, so this is the finish for Black Richard, scourge of Britain. <laughs> it is well. It's only right that you know that for ten years I've been at war with my own beloved land, my own British Isle. I built a free country in the wilderness, one where there's no servitude, no bondage. But now, for me, it's over. Yes, over but for one last task. Last, in England, I was once a rich man. My fortune is still there. I'm alone, having neither wife nor child. Only a sister, God bless her memory. But she's wealthy in her own right. I need someone to bring the money back. Back here to my new country. If I die without a will, it will revert to the crown. Lass, if you could see the smiling faces of the people who live free of bondage... There's nothing I would rather see, Richard. And you shall, too. Because I'll tell you where my free land lies... But first, I must draw a will. You shall be the beneficiary. And I have your solemn word that the money will be turned over to my free colony. My solemn word, sire. I have naught but my dagger. Uh, help me to my knees, child. Yes, sire. Uh, I'm up. Now, lass, in the name of a free people, bear your back. I'm taking my dress off. I shall hurt you, child, mightily. I shall try not to scream. Hand me my dagger. Here, sire. Ready? Ready, sire. No! Black Richard died the next day. I buried him and marked his grave. A short while later, a passing ship rescued me. It was bound for free land, Black Richard's home. What I saw there confirmed everything he told me. Mr. O'Connell, I'm going back to England and to bring back Black Richard's fortune back to those people. And I shall join them in their new way of life. But, Lady Ruth, Black Richard has no standing before the British courts. Even if he had a fortune, if it became known, it would be confiscated by the Crown. Black Richard Templeton was a fictitious name, Mr. O'Connell. There is another name, a real name that he once bore honorably. No one shall know that there was any relationship between the two. Only you and I. But, Lady Ruth, I am the king's counselor. I have sworn allegiance to his majesty. But first I shall take you to visit the people of Freeland. And then you can make your own decision. My ultimate decision was clearly defined when I accompanied Lady Ruth Carroll back to London in order to help her in proving the last will and testament of Black Richard. We were summoned before the House of Peers. I presented her case. My lords, because of the mitigating circumstances which will be known to you, the last will and testament of the deceased can never be actually filed. But I have brought the sole beneficiary before this august body in order that each of you can personally examine the document. Lady Ruth Carroll, I ask you now to disrobe before the House of Peers. Oh, believe me, my lords, I do not show disrespect to either Lady Ruth Carroll or to you. Rest assured that only her back will be exposed. Are you ready, milady? Yes, Mr. O'Connell. Will you please walk up to the lords, milady, and let them examine your back? And with your permission, my lords, I shall read the words tattooed across her back. All to bearer. Signed, Sir George Pemberton, 1724. Many of you remember Sir George Pemberton. He sailed for the colonies ten years ago. Little was heard of him since, save only that he purchased an island in the Bahamas. But by fate or providence, as you will, Sir George Pemberton lived long enough to carve his last will and testament on the back of his own sister. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you what the official records say about the case of the Lady and the Pirate. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer.
And now back to Warren William. In the last pages of his diary about this famous case, John Francis O'Connell says, By special decree, a copy of the last will and testament of Sir George Pemberton was permitted to be filed instead of the original. The reason, of course, was apparent. The diary continues. All of the monies of Sir Pemberton's estate were turned over to the beneficiary, and about six months later, Lady Carroll and I returned to free land forever. And here the diary ends. Was the black anger that Sir Pemberton bore against tyranny and oppression a deadly sin? It might have been. But there are those who think that this personal love of freedom and equality greatly outweighed the apparent injustices made during his life as a pirate. For who in this case can draw the line between pirate and liberator? I can't. Can you? Next week, my story is about a man who, in his last will and testament, bequeathed the one and only thing he held most dear in life to, of all people, his competitor. It was not money nor jewels, but much more important, the girl he loved and hoped to marry. Fortunately for all concerned, this will was never filed for probate. But you'll hear a story as beautiful, as poignant, and as realistic as any ever heard before. We call this unusual story The Prince of Broadway. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Cropine and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. The fascination of the eerie, weird, blood-chilling tales told by old Nancy, the witch of Salem, and Satan, the wise black cat. They are waiting Waiting for you now. <laughs> Honor and sweet sixteen, you're all I be today. Yes, sir. A hundred and sweet sixteen year old. <laughs> <laughs> well, Satan, now that me and you has had our customary sweet evening walk through the sweet cheerful graveyard, we'll all sit to tell folks our customary sweet bedtime story. <laughs> now, tell these folks to douse their lights, and we'll get right down to business. That's right. Make it nice and dark. <laughs> now, draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep, and soon you'll see inside a big old handsome house in little old Maryland. And there begins our story, which we call the Devil Doctor. <laughs> The devil doctor! <laughs> Dad? Oh, Dad? Yeah? 
Will you and Stanley come in? Mr. Roberts is here. Be with you in just a minute. It was awfully good of you to come over, Mr. Roberts. Oh, not at all, Miss Duffus. I had already determined to drop in and bid you welcome to Hartley Manor. I'm afraid it's a very trivial matter that Dad wishes to see you about. Won't you sit down? Well, thank you. I suppose you're very happy to be finally in your new home. Oh, I'm sure we will be. We've scarcely had time to become acquainted with it yet. I see you've made quite a few changes. Oh, yes. Oh, Dad bought this delightful place because it was so old and rich in tradition and immediately decided to modernize it. I'm sure you don't approve. I must confess to a slight dismay. That'll be the reaction of our other neighbors, I imagine. They probably feel it's bad enough that Americans have come to live in this historic landmark. I hope the liberties Dad's taking with it don't add to their resentment. I'd like to be around when they resent it. Dad, I, I didn't hear you and Stanley come in. Oh, this is the Reverend Mr. Roberts. <laughs> I always wear rubbers so I can sneak up on folks and hear what they're saying about me. <laughs> Hiya, Mr. Roberts. Glad you come over. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. You know, this girl of mine egged me into buying this place. Yet ever since I planked down a cool half million for it, she's been kicking about the improvements I've made. If only you wouldn't try to change things too much, Dad. Change is what makes the world go round. Oh, excuse me. You uh, haven't met my future son-in-law, Stanley Davis. Uh, Stan, this is Mr. Roberts, head oh, man of the local church. How do you do? Uh, now, sit down, everyone. Sit down. Before wasting any time in small talk, Roberts, I'm going to tell you why I sent you that message to come over. When I pay for anything, I expect my money's worth, and I paid for something in this house that isn't here. I, I don't quite understand, sir. When I phoned the solicitors who handled the sale of this place, they said you were the man to locate my missing property. I? Oh, they told Dad that as you're extremely familiar with the history of this house, you might help him in his search. Search for what? An ancestor. An ancestor? Yeah, I've been cheated. I was told that in the art gallery down the hall, there were 106 life-size oil paintings of the de Casserac family whose estate this used to be. But there's only 105, which makes one ancestor missing. I see. The 106th portrait isn't really missing, Mr. Duffus. Oh? It's hidden behind a secret panel in this room. A secret panel? What's the idea of hiding my picture there? It was hidden over 300 years ago, Mr. Duffus. Right after its subject died. Why? Because Bertram de Casserac, whose likeness it is, had placed a hideous blot upon his noble family name. He was one of the most infamous monsters who ever lived. Now, what did he do? Allow me to show you his hidden portrait first. It'll make the story more believable. People hereabouts call him the Devil Doctor. The Devil Doctor? Yes. Now, let me see. It's many years ago that I was taught the secret of this panel... The spring is hidden somewhere in this beaded molding at the side. Ah, I found it. Oh, good Lord! I will be... The 106th portrait is rather startling, isn't it? I never saw anything so lifelike. For an instant, it seemed he walked right out of the canvas. Mm, darned if I didn't have the same feeling. Oh, I'm glad he's only painted there. I've never seen such an evil face. All except the eyes. They're expressionless and dead as those of a fish. Oh, please close the panel again, Mr. Robert. Certainly. I think his family were very wise to keep it hidden. I'm half sorry we found it. No, I'm not. I don't know anything about art, but whoever painted that knew his business. It's generally believed in this neighborhood that the artist was Lucifer himself. You mean the devil? Yes. <laughs> That's a new one. According to tradition, that is not a mere portrait, but a second body that Bertram de Casserac will return to and wear someday, if he's able. A second body? Let's hear the story of this old boy. Well, the evil Bertram de Casserac was an alchemist, a delver in black magic, and above all, a Satanist. Oh, you mean he used to... Yes. Instead of God, he worshipped the Prince of Darkness. And in a certain vault below this house was often celebrated that most infamous of ceremonies, the Black Mass. I've heard of it. Yes, yeah, so have I. It's a horrible perversion of the true mass and is offered in honor of the devil. The Satanists offer a sacrifice, usually the life's blood of an innocent child or woman. Say, are you kidding me? Unfortunately, Mr. Duffus, we are stating an awful truth. Bertram was finally accused of witchcraft and arrested. In that vault, an unholy altar was found and hideous parodies of sacred images and vessels. And in a pit beneath the stone floor were discovered the bones of nearly a hundred human beings. Ooh. 
Oh, he was executed, of course. No, he cheated legal punishment by committing suicide. Then, according to the story, the people who so long had feared him rose in arms and demanded his body. They wished to burn it. Fire being considered the only way to completely destroy an evil spirit. His relatives smuggled his remains from the prison and buried them in secret. A bishop of the church attended and sealed each corner of his tomb with a holy cross. To prevent him from rising from the dead. Yes. Well, if that isn't the craziest thing I ever heard of. It happened 300 years ago, Mr. Duffus, in a most superstitious age. Say, where is that vault where the old boy did his dirty work? Below the east turret. East? Uh, that direction? Yes. Bertram's heir had the chamber bricked up. And so it has remained to this day. <laughs> Till yesterday, you mean. I beg your pardon? I told you I was going to change things here. I went down in the cellars yesterday and saw that bricked-up doorway. Looked like valuable space was being wasted behind it. So I had the decorator's men tear it out and use the room to store their packing cases. That vault is open? Sure, why not? Does anyone know of this? I just told you the decorator's men opened it. Oh, but they are from London and unfamiliar with the story. Mr. Duffus, if this becomes known around here, half this countryside will be thrown into a panic. Oh, you mean that? I mean the legend of the devil doctor is a living truth to the people of this region. I beg you to have that door resealed at once. What do the fools think will happen because that room is open? Oh, I told you their belief about that portrait. You mean that old Bertram will return to life? If he is able and you have rendered his spirit a service by unbarring the way to his tomb. His tomb? Yes, for below the vault where he buried his victims, Bertram himself was buried. His body is in that room? Embedded in solid masonry. By golly, it's beneath the center of the floor. I remember seeing four metal crosses on the corners of a big slab and wondered what they meant. Oh, I want to see it. So do I. Now that I know what it all means, I'd like another look myself. Come on, Robert. I... Uh... Oh, yes, yes. I, I would like to see it, too. The stairs are right down this hall. You don't have to tell Mr. Roberts, Dad. He knows this house better than any of us. I'm afraid I do. And that is the reason, Mr. Duffus, I request you to seal that vault again. Say, if you weren't a preacher, I'd say you took this stuff about the devil doctor pretty serious. As a preacher, I accept the Bible as the word of God. And Holy Writ bears many testimonies that evil powers exist which are dangerous to man. Hmm. Hmm. Well, here's the cellar door. Say, help Edith down these steps, Stanley. They're pretty steep and carpeted with <laughs> dust. You see how useless is an attempt to convince my father of anything, Mr. Roberts? He won't even believe my fiancé will help me downstairs unless he's told. Oh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I made my money bossing people, Mr. Roberts. Guess it's become such a habit I even do it in my own home. But speaking of convincing me, no one will ever make me believe there's any truth in superstition. Yeah, the vault's over this way. Well, I haven't been down here before. Neither have I. After hearing Mr. Roberts' story, I shan't make it a habit. Uh, Mr. Roberts, since it's believed that part of the devil doctor's a creation of infernal magic, why was it never destroyed? Because there is a further tradition that whoever harms it will be destroyed themselves. Right. Well, there's the vault just ahead. Your men didn't break the door. It wasn't necessary. When they tore out the bricks that covered it, the, the door was standing open. Open? Yeah. Strange. In the ancient record, it said the door was closed and locked. Now, well, mind these packing cases you come in. You're liable to snag your clothes on a bent nail. Oh, there are shavings all over the place. Yeah, I saw the crosses about there, where the big crate is standing now. Hey, give me a hand with it, Stan. We'll push it out of the way. Yes, sir. You ready? Let's go. Come on. All right. All right. Well, oh, this spot must wear a top. Yeah, Edith's concert grand piano was created in it. Yeah, this would be the case we'd have to move. Come on. Oh, there. there. I can see a metal crucifix. Yes. Connecting slab and floor. But where are the others? Now, one should be right here. If they're placed at all four corners. But there isn't one there. There are none at those far edges. Ah, uh, they were there yesterday. Oh, Dad. You and Stan must have torn them away with that heavy case. Doggone, I guess you're right. <laughs> Mr. Roberts, if the old devil doctor is half the man you say, he ought to jump right up and dance now. <laughs> with just one cross to hold him down. Oh, he does. What's the matter? The slab just moved. Moved? I felt it move under my hand. Ah, uh -huh, quit your kidding. Why oh, not? Mr. Duffus, feel the edges of this slab. What about him? Lord, I, I see what you mean. Dad... 
They're an inch above this floor. You're crazy. <laughs> They're absolutely level with it. Feel here, Mr. Duffus. Now your hand is beside the one remaining cross. Mm, that's funny. Yes, it is. And none of you are chumps enough to think this slab has risen since we pulled those crosses off, eh? But I felt it move. Imagination. It's probably always been like this. Oh, it couldn't have been, sir. If it had been raised like this before, the sharp edge would have caught the cleats in that piano case. We couldn't have pushed it a foot. Mr. Duffus, you may think me a credulous old fool, but I beg you to have those crosses found and replaced immediately. Then have this vault received. I'll do nothing of the kind. Oh, I think you better, Dad. Yeah, perhaps you had. Say, are you three children or grown-up men and women? Oh, Dad, for once in your life, give, give in to someone else. When we entered this vault, I thought the story of the devil doctor is fantastic as you still do. But in the last few minutes, since you moved that case, I... Oh, there's something awful in here that's making me afraid. I'm not ashamed to admit I feel the same way. It's as though we four weren't alone in this vault. As though something repulsive and, and deadly is in here with us. There is an unseen presence here. Can't you sense it, Mr. Duffus? No. And when I prove all this is bunk, you won't sense it either. Where do I find a tool of some kind? Here, this loose board will do. What are you going to do with that board? Bring you to your senses and smash a crazy legend. Oh, he means to break that last cross. Oh, no, Dad. Don't. Stop him. Uh, <coughs> I thought a good sound whack would do it. You've broken the crucifix. The tomb is no longer sealed. And not a thing has happened. You thought that slab would fly up and hit the ceiling, I suppose, and the old gentleman below would appear in a burst of flame. <laughs> I told you I'd bring changes around here. You'll have to change a good story now for your crucifix is broken and not a thing has happened. <laughs> What's that? What? Someone's laughing. In this fault. No, it comes from underneath. <gasps> that slab. One side slowly moving. Good Lord. Pushing it upward. A skeleton. <laughs> Wrapped in a crumbling shroud. It's rising from that tomb. Oh, run, Edith, run! Yes. Ah. To the stairs! The stairs! Oh, God, forgive me, what have I done? What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> Darling, you must pull yourself together. We're safe now, safe. Yes, that cellar door is locked and barred. We're double locked inside this room. If we did see a thing that all common sense denies, it can't get at us here. If we saw it, do you doubt the evidence of all our eyes? Do you think locked doors will prevent that frightful thing from going where it wishes? That hideous nightmare you delivered from its tomb? That's what it was, a nightmare. It couldn't have been real. It's too impossible. So one might say who, for the first time, saw a boa constrictor. Well, that's a natural thing. Whatever is, is natural. Supernatural is merely a word to denote things rare in human experience. We know this thing exists. Oh, I can still see the awful horror of its fleshless bones. That crumbling shroud. Edith, and... darling. I can still hear its frightful laughter and smell that sickening odor of decay and mold and death. Edith, you've got to snap out of this. If you'd only let us leave this house, as the servants did when we ran screaming from that cellar, if you hadn't insisted we remain here... I didn't ask any of you to stay here. I said I wouldn't run away like a panic-stricken fool. Oh, you knew we wouldn't go and leave you here alone. But now night's coming, and darkness... Look here, we've got to look at this thing like sensible human beings instead of superstitious children. So you said as you broke the crucifix upon that doom. And I still think I was right. Oh, I don't deny I've been as scared as the rest of you. Cold shivers are still running up and down my spine. But I didn't travel the distance I've reached in life by being a credulous fool. You can't deny the evidence of all our senses. No, but I can find an explanation of the way that they were tricked. My mind is beginning to think normally again, and it begins to see a light. Now, what do you mean, sir? When I overheard Edith telling you this afternoon that folks around here resented our living in this old house, I think she called a turn on everything that's happened. We're not wanted here. Someone conceived the bright idea of scaring us away. Mr. Duffus. And you, Roberts, were a party to that plan. I, sir? Father. He came here with his talk of the devil, Doctor, didn't he? He showed us that picture, told us about the vault, and got us so steamed up we went down to see that tomb. You seriously believe me guilty of a deliberate and malicious plot? Yes. Mr. Roberts is a clergyman. Which makes his skulldudgery ten times worse. By Jove, I believe you're right. 
Stan. Mr. Davis. Well, that explains the thing we saw on natural ground. You think? I think the ghost we saw was just a man. Oh, you're just mad. No. At last, we're sane. That vault was dark. We could see objects, nothing more. A man was concealed in that tomb. It was his laughter we heard, human laughter. The slab was so prepared he could lift it from below. Then, dressed in one of those skeleton suits I've seen at masquerades, he appeared to scare the living daylights out of us. You forget that it was you who opened the vault, you who broke the seals upon that tomb. Details. If I hadn't played into your hands, you'd have found another way. Miss Duffus, you don't... Yes, I agree with Dad and Stanley, Mr. Roberts. How could you do such an awful thing to us? On my solemn word of honor, I swear you are mistaken. You've done enough. Don't make it worse with lies. Your plan has failed, Mr. Parson. Go and tell the others who don't want John Duffus for a neighbor that he don't scare. I've paid for this house and I'm going to live in it in spite of you and all your devil, Dr. Ghost. <laughs> That laugh we heard downstairs. But now it's in the hall, outside this room. Yeah, the laugher doesn't know his little farce has been played out, but he soon will know. Don't open that door. Ah, come on, Stan. Let's find this laughing skeleton. Oh, don't go out there. I'm so afraid. I'm not. Stan, turn on these hall lights so we don't slip by us in the dark. I got him, sir. Gentlemen, I beg. Well, you shut up. Stan, which way do you think that laughter went? Oh, that way. Toward the drawing room. Well, come on. Dad, Stanley, huh? wait. What? Look, the cellar door. It's still locked and bolted as we left it. Well, a laughing skeleton came up some other way. There is no other way out of the cellars. And you can see that no mortal creature has entered through that door. Yet we heard his laugh from where we're standing now. That doesn't mean a thing. Come on. Now, wait, sir. Perhaps my imagination's playing me tricks, but there's a peculiar odor in this hall. I smell it, too. It's an odor of decay and mold and... Death. You've made it plain how little you value my advice. But by everything that's holy, I beg you to leave this house. Not much, I won't. Dad, look there. Lord, upon this floor. A trail of mold. Oh, that piece of cloth. It's a fragment of the shroud that figure wore. Look, as I touch it, it crumbles into dust. It's all a trick. But tricks don't fool me any longer. <laughs> Again. It is in the drawing room. Where the devil doctor's portrait hangs. Well, what do you mean? I have told you the legend of that picture. <laughs> the laugh has changed. It's become stronger, almost human. It's altogether human. Human enough to be punched in the jaw, and that's what it's going to get. Mr. Duffus, wait! After him! Don't go! Let him go in that room alone! He's playing with fire, fire that will consume us all. He's disappeared through that dark doorway. Quickly! Oh, Mr. Duffus! Where are you? By the window. He's not going to slide by me. You stay at the door, Stan, and turn on the lights so we can see. I have them. Yeah, there's no one in the room. Oh, that panel. It's open as I feared. But the portrait's there, thank heaven. <laughs> Did you expect to find it gone? It's changed. Those eyes we thought so dead this afternoon now shine with light. They look alive. Another trick. No. Lord, help us all. The devil doctor lives again. <laughs> The laugh is coming from that picture. The portrait stepping from its frame. The lights! Who lights. put out the lights? Lights! Lights, for heaven's sake! Edith, where are you? I can't see a thing in this darkness. Edith! Edith! They have me in his arms. I'm the golden death. Ah. Ah. He's taking, ah. taking her away. Where? I can't see her. Ah. Ah, the laugh is going towards the cellar door. That leads to the vault. To the room of the devil's mess. Which way is it, Stan? Oh, God, where is that vault? I'm as completely lost as you are. Roberts was right. We should have waited for a lamp before coming to the cellar. Oh, that would have taken time. And that devil has my Edith. Oh, God, forgive me. Davis! Mr. Duffus! Uh, Roberts, he's brought a lantern. I would to him, quick. Hey, we're coming, Roberts. Do you still think he tricked us? Not anymore. No trick would have brought that picture from its frame, and we saw it happen. Roberts, quick, take us to that vault. It's, it's at the far end. In the darkness, we've been searching in the opposite direction. This old-fashioned lantern doesn't give much light, but it was all that I could find. It's enough. Hurry. You've heard nothing further since you came down here? No. The laughter has stopped. And so have Edith's cries. Ah, she'd fainted, I suppose. My daughter. Oh, God, forgive me. There's the vault ahead. And the door's closed. Well, I'll soon... I don't... It's barred inside. Help me, Stan. I'm with you. Oh, but that door is solid oak and sheathed with iron. You'll never break it that way. No, it, 
doesn't even budge. Oh, what are we going to do? Uh, that heavy beam line there. Uh, we'll use it as a battering ram. Wait, listen. A voice inside chanting something in Latin. Yes, the black mass. The black mass? In honor of Lucifer, the devil doctor is about to offer up a sacrifice. Edith. Oh, my kid. You've got to break in that door. Quick. Yeah, got to. Got to. Stand that ram. With everything we have. It doesn't even give. Again. Oh, what's that devil saying? His monstrous ritual nears the time of offering. The ram, stand the ram. Oh, the door won't give. Oh, when it does, how are we to stop that thing inside? A thing that's neither of the living or the dead. In faith, there is a way. Break down that door. Oh, Father, help me to be strong. Give thy servant faith and help him banish fear. I felt it give that time, but the voice is going inside. Yes, it's awful prayers to evil. Break that door or we shall be too late. Father, give thy servant faith. Help him banish fear. We've got to break it down. It gave then split it again with all you've got. Aye. Aye. We've crushed it. Come on. Ada. She's lying on the slab. A living altar. The devil's holding a knife above her breast. I'll get him. <laughs> ah, I can't move. No, I. By some power, he's stopped us in our tracks. He lifts the knife. You said you had a way to stop him. By the power of the cross, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I beat ah! you. He ah! laugh. He holds that knife above my daughter. Oh, my fear is stronger than my faith. Oh, Father, help me. <laughs> no, not my kid. No, no. Mister Dapper's broke the spell. Covered a body with his own. The knife is buried in his back. <laughs> the devil, Doctor, is raising the knife again. But the oh. Father's love has shown my faith the way to banish fear. Oh. In the name of the one and only God, I bid you who men once called the cataract return to the hell from which you came. He us. He retreats. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <laughs> Dan, who's oh, Dan? He's covered with blood. Get Edith from this vault. Away from that fiend. Oh, no, he can't hurt us now. He's backing towards his tomb. Where another fool like me can bring him back someday. But I've heard of a way to destroy a thing like him forever. Give me that lantern. Dan. I started in the shavings. It's called fire. Oh, yes. Oh. Between that devil and the only door. And he's not laughing now. He knows there's no escape. Run! Run, all of you! In a moment, this place will be a third and... Yeah! Run! Oh. Dad! He's fallen! Uh, Roberts, help me lift him. Get him out of here. Yes. Yeah. Save yourselves. His knife has done for me. No! You can't die, Dad! You can't! Put me down, oh, you fellows. Get my kid out of here. Put me down, I tell you. The fire won't reach us for a minute here, and I won't keep you quite that long. Well, that's it. Thanks. Dad. Oh, Dad. I always would have my way, eh, kid? Roberts, you said whoever destroyed that portrait was doomed to be destroyed themselves. And I guess I've pretty well wrecked the subject of that picture. Well, I wanted to change things around here. And now you'll have to change your story about the devil, Doctor. Because I've brought it to an end. Change is what makes the world go round. Dad! Dad! My father's dead! <laughs> He also brings our story to an end. <laughs> and now we'll go find ourselves a nice graveyard and get inspiration for a pretty bedtime yarn to spin these folks another time. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.